five. Keisha kept her eyes down and bit her lip to keep from giggling as she passed her two youngest brothers. Of all the things that she thought she'd ever see in her lifetime, this was certainly the least likely of them. Here they were, up to their elbows in soap and water, doing their own laundry in the yard in full sight of everyone. I have to admit, they're going about it the right way too," she thought as she opened the gate and hurried off to her workshop. Theirs is a better system than Mum ever had. Her mother had always washed the clothing in the house, then brought the baskets of wet clothing out to hang on their lines in the sun to dry. The boys, however, had a different system. Instead of using the sinks in the house, they'd had the cooper make them two half barrels on legs, with stopcocks as in a wine barrel in the bottoms for drain holes. One half barrel was for wash water, the other for rinsing. They had a fire going in the fire pit with a tripod and a kettle over it, burning trash as well as heating the water for washing. The barrels held easily twice as much as the sink, maybe more, which meant that stubborn stains could soak while they scrubbed other garments. One boy scrubbed, the other rinsed, wrung, and hung, and they traded jobs each time they drained the tubs and refilled them with clean water or water and soap. From the determined way in which they were scrubbing, they were doing a good job of it too. I think they're going to get the clothes done in half the time it takes Mum. Keisha thought with admiration. They're faster than she is and stronger. They'll surely get half a day on the farm if they want to. Of course, the fact that their brothers are paying them to do their clothes isn't hurting their feelings at all. Who knows? Maybe they'll start getting business from people outside the family and have a trade of their own. Keisha assiduously did her own laundry. It wasn't that difficult to manage with only the clothing for one person. Just like keeping the workshop clean, it wasn't a lot of work as long as you kept up with it. She had underthings that she'd left soaking in the sink overnight, as a matter of fact, and she intended to do a batch of tunics as soon as she rinsed out the underthings. That was why she was in a hurry. She wanted to have her laundry out of the way before anyone came to her with a complaint. She reached the workshop without being intercepted, and shortly had a neat line of white things drying in the garden. The tunics went in to soak in the same bleaching solution that she'd had the underwear soaking in. She'd decided that it wasn't going to hurt to try to bleach out the old stains, even if it removed all of the old color as well. Now that she was doing a little of the dye work that Shandy used to, she was getting more and more interested in doing something with the same substances that had caused those stains in the first place. One of them had been a very quiet gray green. Not the same, rather attractive new mint color that the trainee healer tunics had been, but if she could bleach all the stains out and re-dye the tunics that color, it wouldn't be a bad thing to get people used to seeing me in green. I could ease into it. Besides, sooner or later I'll have to wear the trainee uniforms, and the moment I do, I just know I'll get them stained too. Maybe she could get herself used to being in green at the same time. Meanwhile, while the tunic soaked and her experiment in bleaching worked or didn't, there was the garden to tend. She left all the windows open as well as the door, even though it was a little nippy, for the bleaching solution gave off fumes she was suspicious of. In her oldest and shabbiest tunic, with a canvas smock over it, she went into the herb garden and knelt down beside the rows of seedlings, a bucket beside her. Immediately, she felt good, calm, happy, and productive. The garden had that effect on her nearly every time she worked in it. These sprouting shapes under cones of cheesecloth, loose enough to allow them sun, but heavy enough to protect from frost and heavy rain, were from the new seeds she'd gotten from Steelmind. 
Since she hadn't known what they were going to look like when they came up, she had very carefully dyed handfuls of splinters and stuck one into the ground right next to each seed before she covered it with earth. Now, as she worked beside each row, she pulled out anything sprouting that didn't have a colorful little splinter beside it. Of course, this was far more work than anyone would want to do normally, but it was only for these new plants. Her perennials, of course, were already well grown, and it was no work to pick out the annuals she knew from the weed sprouts. I'm just glad these new ones are all perennials, she thought, as she pulled out sprouting weeds that were barely visible and dusted them into her bucket, replacing the cones over her precious new seedlings as she worked. There will only be one season of this kind of care. She pulled weeds until her back ached and her hands had grime ground under all the nails. Then she judged that she'd done enough and called it a done task. She dumped the bucket of weeds onto her compost heap and took the empty bucket into her workshop. The fumes weren't as bad as she'd expected, and the experiment in bleaching was a qualified success. Once she'd rinsed out the tunics and wrung them dry enough to dye, she looked them over carefully and judged that the dye she'd prepared would probably cover the faint stains that were left. Even if it didn't, she wasn't any worse off than she'd been before. The dye itself simmered in a big pot over the fireplace. She'd left it there all night to strengthen. Now she built up the fire a bit and dumped the first tunic in, stirring it with a peeled stick until it reached the color she wanted. Shortly after that, a line of gray-green tunics flapped beside the line of white underthings, and Keisha had replaced the pot of dye with one of soup fixings. That was when she got her first patient of the day. A knock on the doorframe made her look up, as Furla Dawkin came in with her five-year-old in her arms, blood splattered liberally all over both of them. By now, Keisha was a shrewd and instant judge of situations. Furla wasn't hysterical, wasn't running, wasn't even out of breath. Therefore, the situation wasn't anywhere near as bad as it looked. Furla's words confirmed that. If you're not busy, Keisha, Dib's gotten into a fight. Bring him over to the fire and lay him down on the rug, she said and his mother put the boy down while Keisha got clean rags and a fresh bucket of water. The boy had been quiet right up until the moment that Keisha sat down on the floor beside him. Then he set up a howl like a Pelagir monster before she'd so much as touched him. He was a sorry sight, face red, blood in his hair, and oozing from his nose and mouth, angry tears running down his fat cheeks. Keisha ignored the tears and the howling. She was used to them. She went straight to work, gently washing off the blood until she could make an accurate assessment of the damages. Well, Furla, he's lost a tooth, he's got a nosebleed, and he'll have a fine black eye in a bit, so I'd say he was the loser in this battle, she finally told the anxious mama. Here, Dib. She made him lie down on the floor and pinched a rag over his nose. You lie there, and we'll see if we can't get your nose to stop bleeding. Who'd you take on? Maffy Olin, came the muffled reply. He called me a dumbhead. Well, that'll teach you to ignore people who are bigger than you are when they call you names, won't it? she asked matter-of-factly, as one big brown eye gazed at her around the rag held to his nose. Do you know what I used to say when my brothers called me a dumbhead? Uh-uh, the child replied. I'd say, it takes one to know one, so what are you then? Try that, instead of tearing into a bigger boy next time. She winked at him, Maffy's not so dim that he can't work that one out for himself, and it'll make him madder than you. 
Remember, if he comes after you and hits you first, then he's a bully picking on you littles, and you can tattle to his mum, for she won't put up with Maffy turning into a bully, and you know his mum will tan his hide for him. Keisha, the mother said, half laughing and half aghast. Is that anything to tell him? She cocked an eye at Furla. All I know is it worked for me. My brothers stopped calling me names because they got tired of getting a licking from Mum that was worse than anything they dealt out to me. They couldn't complain either because they'd started it by name calling. Her bit of advice had certainly silenced the child anyway. He seemed to be pondering it as they waited for his nose to stop bleeding. When Keisha judged that it had been long enough, she had him sit up and cautiously took the rag away from his nose. There was no further leakage, so she got up and mixed him a quick potion: chamomile for the ache in his eye and nose, marshmallow and mint to counter any tummy upset from swallowing blood, and honey and allspice to make it into a treat. Now she said, handing him the mug. Here's a sweetie for being brave and doing what I told you. His face lit up. For every child in the village knew that when Keisha told them something was a sweetie, it was worth eating or drinking. She never lied to them about the taste of a medicine. If it was bad, she told them and advised them to get it down fast so they could have a sweet to take away the bad taste. He seized the mug and happily drank down the contents. She made up a poultice of cress and plantain and gave it to his mother. Have him lie down a bit more with this on his eye, and when he can't keep still any longer, let him go play. It's a pity about the tooth, but at least it's a baby one. She looked down at Dib, who stared solemnly up at her, and mind what I said about fighting. Yes, Keisha," the boy said, with a look as if he was already contemplating mischief. As his mother helped him to his feet, the two left with Dib trotting sturdily along beside his mother, battered but unrepentant. Keisha went out to check her drying laundry and found it ready to bring in. A distant growl from above made her glance quickly up at the sky to the west, and she frowned when she saw how quickly clouds were building in that direction. Thunder towers, for certain sure. No telling how long it would last either. A spring rain could be over before sunset, or linger for days. She gathered in her clothing without folding it as she usually did. She just unpinned it from the line and dumped everything in the basket, anxious to beat the rain and get her things inside the workshop. She made it inside before anything came down, but the first drops started plopping into the dust just as she closed the door. It was as she was folding the laundry inside the workshop that she heard thunder rumble again, much nearer. Then heard the rain suddenly strengthen, rattling the thatch and pelting the path outside. A moment more, and it wasn't just a few drops; it was a downpour, a downpour without much thunder, just more growling now and again. There wasn't much wind, which didn't augur well for the storm blowing past in a hurry. She shut all the windows as some rain splashed inside, then lit her lanterns to ward off growing darkness. When she cracked the door open and peeked out, what she saw confirmed that this was not going to be a simple cloudburst over quickly. Not with the amount coming down, the slate gray of the clouds overhead, and the relative lack of lightning and thunder. I'm glad the seedlings are up and they're in drained beds. She thought with a sigh, and I'm glad I put those gauze cones over them to protect them. This is likely to last for the next three days. If she hadn't put the cones over them, her precious new plants would be flattened before sunset. With that in mind, she considered going out now and collecting some foodstuffs. She might be spending a lot of time in the workshop or tending flues and colds. I'd better. I can't just live on vegetable soup. 
Getting out her waterproof rain cape, she put the hood up, slipped on a pair of wooden clogs, bowed her head to the storm, and plodded out into it. Beneath the hood of the cape, she watched her footing. Already the rain had pooled into some deepish puddles, deep enough that her clogs wouldn't keep her feet dry if she blundered into one. As she came to the hedge around her house, she looked up, wondering if her brothers had the sense to bring the clothing in. The line at her house was empty, so her brothers had saved their laundry from a drenching, but the right-hand neighbor hadn't been so lucky. Tansy Gelcress struggled with wet clothing, flapping rain cape, and a basket she didn't want to put down. Keisha couldn't simply go into the house with that going on next door. She stopped long enough to help Tansy gather in her things, then went on up the path to her own house. Everybody will be coming home. They can't work in the wet. I'll get the fire going so they have a warm house to come back to. She built up the fire in the kitchen, then surveyed the kitchen stocks, deciding what her mother wouldn't mind her taking. Ham, cheese, eggs, butter, a jug of cider. That'll do. I have beans, flour, basic staples at the shop. I have a quarter of a loaf of bread, and I'll be out enough that I can get more bread from the baker. We've plenty more of what I'm taking at the farm. She can send Da after more if she needs to. People will start bringing barter stuff like eggs and milk around here as soon as I start handing out cough potions. That was part of the arrangement with the village, after all. Since Keisha wasn't a single male who needed to be cooked for and looked after, the family got foodstuffs on an irregular basis. Things usually started appearing when Keisha had done a lot of work in a short period of time. Gathering her spoils up into a basket and covering it with a fold of her cape, she went out into the storm again, only to see the neighbor waving frantically at her from the door of her house. She splashed across the yard, fearing that someone had already gotten sick. But Tansy handed her a bundle wrapped in a clean dishcloth. I made seed cakes, and I thought, since you'll probably be busy in this nasty weather, that you might like to take some to your workshop to nibble on in between emergencies, she said as she patted Keisha's hand. There, just a little thanks for being a good neighbor. Thank you, Keisha replied, touched and pleased and a little dumbfounded. Thank you very much. They'll be appreciated. Now, don't let me keep you standing here. Go, the woman told her, making a shooing motion. I don't want to be the one responsible for drowning you. Keisha left, making her way through the growing runnels of water, protecting both sets of provisions under her rain cape. People are noticing. They're really noticing what I do. It wasn't just a reward for helping with the laundry. The neighbor had specifically said, I thought you'd probably be busy in this nasty weather. Somehow, she felt immensely better than she had a few moments ago and quite ready to meet whatever the weather brought with a steady spirit. The wind picked up, sending the edges of her cape flapping, and there was a definite edge to it that there hadn't been before. It was getting colder and that wasn't good. Cold teas, sore throat syrups, cough syrups, fever teas, herb and garlic packets for chicken soup. She started cataloging all the things she was going to need as soon as she got through the door. Her workshop seemed doubly cozy after the bitter weather outside. She shook out her cape and hung it up, then slipped her clogs off and padded around in her stockings, knowing that she'd have to put the clogs back on as soon as someone called on her. Quickly stowing her provisions in her food cupboard, she put beans to soak for soup tomorrow. If the rain lasted, tomorrow would be the day when the first colds made their appearance, and she'd be busy all day. She took long enough to eat her vegetable soup with sliced bread and butter. If things got bad, it might be bedtime before she had another chance to eat— then she set about inventorying her cold medicines and putting together batches of whatever she thought she'd need more of. 
Her hands flew as her mind worked. Was it likely that anyone would get caught by flooding? With the way this rain was coming down, it was a possibility. Though people tended to be pretty sensible about rising water this time of year, it was only in the summer that people got lazy, were too busy, or were having too good a time to pay attention to the possibility of flash floods. Last year had brought a fine honey harvest, and she had plenty stocked away for making soothing syrups. With a surplus of extra jugs, she'd gone ahead and made more decoctions of comfrey, lobelia, hyssop, and whorehound than she usually did. Now her preparations paid off. It didn't take long for her to mix those four ingredients, chamomile and lemon balm tinctures, plus the honey for cough syrup. Work didn't stop just because people got colds. It was up to her to make certain they could do their work, even with one. Late afternoon brought the first of the emergencies. People might be sensible about flooding, but unfortunately cows were as stubborn and stupid as rocks. Some of the water meadows started getting knee-deep, and several folk had to wade in to lead their cattle out. The floods were too deep for the herd dogs to work in, so each fool cow had to be caught and led to safety by hand. So a handful of people came home, chilled to the bone, and blew around the lips, and Keisha was there with hot medicinal teas and packets of preventative herbs to go into the evening soup or stew. No harm if the rest of the family got the medicines either. All that would happen was that everyone would get sleepy earlier and go off to bed. A warm bed was the best place anyone could be on a night like this one. The cattle had to be treated too for the results of their boneheadedness, so out she went to three different farms, making sure each silly cow got her drench. Keisha had her villagers well trained. At the first sign of a sniffle, mothers came to the door for syrups and teas for their littles. There was a steady parade of them just after supper time, as children who'd gone out healthy came home sneezing because they would play in the puddles and not come in until they were as soaked and blue as the men who'd rescued the cattle. These weren't the things she charged for. She'd early come to the conclusion that if she took her pay for run-of-the-mill healing in the things the villagers were already supplying her, it was more likely that they'd come to her early rather than waiting until the illness was truly serious. Doses with enough sleepy-making potential to make people stay abed a candle mark or two longer when they were mildly sick would keep them from getting sicker. Keeping a cold at the level of sniffles and coughs in a child kept it from turning into something that could kill. She'd charge the farmers for the cattle drenches, but only after the rains were over, and only because they had asked her to give the doses herself. Then again, she thought wearily, after she'd trudged back to the shop from what she hoped would be the last call of the night— I can get the stuff down their throats without them fighting me. When they do it, more of it goes on the cow than in, poor things. Absolutely, positively, no point in going home to sleep. Everyone knew that in weather like this. She'd be at the shop where everything she might need was at hand. I'm just glad I got the laundry done, she told herself, as she closed the door behind her and surveyed the wreck of her workshop. I hope they give me some time to get this cleaned up in the morning before they haul me out again. She followed her own prescription and added a packet of her herbs to the last of the soup before she ate it. As she'd anticipated, she hadn't had a chance for a meal after that first bowl. Then she put the beans, seasoning, and some ham into another pot and put that over the fire to cook all night. She managed to wash up the dishes and the first soup pot, but ran out of energy and took two seed cakes and a mug of cider up to the loft where she snuggled into her bed, leaving them on the little table beside the bed for a quick bite if someone pulled her out in the middle of the night. 
But that night, at least, her sleep was unbroken, and the cakes and cider made a perfectly good breakfast. It was an unexpected luxury to eat breakfast in bed, with the rain drumming down on the roof outside and the savory aroma of bean soup filling the workshop. She didn't linger long, though. She was up and washed and clothed quickly, dressing for the weather, no telling when she'd be called out again. I could do myself a big favor by getting baskets ready to snatch up, she decided, and lined up four on the workbench. Into one went standard remedies for minor human ailments, and into the second the same sorts of things for animals. Into the other two went medicines for more serious complications. She didn't think she'd have to use the one for people, but the fellowship beasts were so sensitive— She'd no sooner finished the fourth basket when someone knocked on the door, then came in without waiting for a reply. It was Alice from the Fellowship. Keisha grabbed the fourth basket without waiting to hear what brought her. It's the sheep, right? Alice nodded. Cough, she said anxiously. It's odd, a dry, hacking sort of cough. Ha! Huh. Alice didn't recognize it, that was clear, but Keisha did. Her own family flock had gotten the illness in a rainy spring like this one. She turned to get a different jar of heavy concentrate down off the top shelf and put it in her basket as well. No worries, I've got what we'll need. They'll be fine as long as we get them warm and dry and get my stuff into them. Come on. She swung on her rain cape and slipped her feet into her clogs, heading straight out the door. Alice followed, her brow creased anxiously. "'How are we going to get them dry and warm?' she asked. "'They're soaked to the skin.' Keisha stopped in the doorway and made a mental inventory of the fellowship buildings, and realized Alice was right. There was no way to get the sheep under cover on fellowship property— but there was the village threshing barn, empty and unused at this time of year, and with the favors the fellowship had done the village, they were certainly owed a favor from the village in return. "'Get your dogs and herders and bring all the sheep up to the threshing barn,' she ordered. "'We'll use that until the rain is over. Don't worry, I'll make sure it's right. I'll meet you there.' Alice took her word as good and trotted off through the puddles toward the fellowship holding. Keisha stopped just long enough at the mayor's house to confirm the right of the fellowship to use the octagonal barn until the rains were done, so long as they supplied fodder for the sheep and cleaned up after them. Keisha hurried to the barn and let down the oiled canvas interior sides that shut out the wind and rain when need be. The canvas hadn't come cheap, but in the rush of prosperity following the sale of the barbarians' looted goods, it had been a sound investment. Now the barn could be used for many purposes in all weathers, even in the dead of winter— it became a tight, weatherproof and windproof tent with a fine shingled roof and seven external supporting walls of wood. It was a tight squeeze, but you can even hold a fair in there. The eighth wall, the one opposite the door, was of stone and did not have a canvas cover, but that was the very last thing it needed. By the time she'd done lacing all the canvas panels together, the poor sodden sheep showed up, bleeding and coughing pathetically. No doubt about that cough. Keisha had heard it before, and the illness felt the same as soon as she touched her hands to one of the sheep. Bring them in, then start squeezing the water out of their fleeces, she ordered, as Alice and four more fellowship shepherds hustled their charges into the barn. When you've got them all as dry as you can, bring clean straw in here for them to bed down in. I know it'll seem like a waste, but trust me, I want it belly deep for the sheep in here. They have to get warm and stay warm, or you might start losing lambs nods all around, neither questions nor arguments. 
Keisha went outside to start a fire in the big oven built into the eighth stone side of the barn. The door of the oven faced the outside, inconvenient to say the least, but entirely necessary when you realized that the floor of the barn would be covered in flammable things like straw whenever the barn was in use. There was always a huge pile of wood under a cover next to the oven. It would be a while before the stone wall heated up enough for the warmth to build up in the barn, but that was all right. This would solve the problem of getting the delicate sheep warmed clear through. And if any other animals start looking seedy, they can be brought here too. She reminded herself to tell the mayor that on her way back to her workshop. Once the fire was going well, Keisha stacked logs all around it and went back into the barn. With the only light coming from a couple of storm lanterns the shepherds had thoughtfully brought with them, it was pretty dim. But Keisha knew the contents of her basket well. Before very long, she had the water skins she generally used to dose animals full, and had the concentrated cough potion mixing with the water inside. As each poor sheep was squeezed relatively dry, she took it from the hands of its helper over to the stone wall where one of the lanterns hung. There, she looked deeply into its confused, frightened eyes and told it without words that it was safe, that she would be helping it, and that if it drank what she gave it, the nasty cough would stop. Then she promised that there would be warmth, dry straw to lie in, and peace for as long as the rain fell. She filled her mind with those images of warmth and safety until she felt the sheep relax under her hands and saw the eyes lose their fear. Then she eased the sheep's mouth open and slipped the neck of the water skin past the back of the tongue. How she could tell that she'd gotten enough of a dose into each sheep, she couldn't have said in words. She only knew that something told her when she'd poured exactly the right amount down its throat. That was when she let the sheep go. It would wander off and join the rest of the dosed flock, making beds in the straw that more of the fellowship folk were spreading on the floor. This was tedious work. Not hard, except for those drying off the sheep, but tedious. Talking to the sheep without words was tiring, too. Keisha wasn't sure why, but it took something out of her. The good part was that about the time she was half through, the stone wall began radiating warmth, so the second half of her task was accomplished in relative comfort. When she turned the last of the sheep loose, and now none of them was coughing, she stood up with a little groan and put the now flat water skins back in her basket. Alice waited patiently to hear what other orders she had. You'll have to keep the oven stoked, and if anyone wants to bake something in it or put in a casserole or something, let them. That's part of the bargain, Keisha told her. Mayer said you'll have to supply your own fodder. She already knew she didn't have to tell them to clean up after themselves. When the sheep left this barn, you'd be able to eat off the floor. Now, what your little beauties have got isn't exactly a sickness. Not yet, anyway. It's not, Alice said, puzzled. Keisha shook her head. It's some Pelagir fungus, like ergot, but it grows on sheep sorrel instead of wheat down near the roots. Heat and freezing kill it. That's why you won't see it in summer or winter, and it needs a warm spring with a lot of rain to start, which we've had. Alice nodded. But we've had warm springs with lots of rain before. You're still all right, so long as the ground stays dry, not soaked like it's been. Then, what it needs to spread is a cold rain in the middle of the warm spring, she shrugged. Here's where I don't know why. It just does. Otherwise, it just sits down at the roots of the sheep sorrel, and your sheep will crop right over the top of it and never come to harm. 
since this is a lung sickness, maybe they have to breathe something in. All I know for certain is that if you don't have the fungus in your fields, your sheep will be all right. And if you don't have a cold, steady rain, your sheep will be all right. And if you bring your sheep off the fields where the fungus is until after it's been raining for a day or so, you'll be all right. Our sheep got it a time or two, and it knocked them down hard. I'm afraid yours would be in trouble if I hadn't got the stuff into them that kills the rot that they breathe in. Now, though, with heat and good food and the medicine, they'll be strong enough to fight it off and come out fine. Alice looked relieved and nodded. The Chiras all went into their barn and wouldn't come out as soon as the rain started, and the goats are in their shelter, and none of them are coughing. It was just the sheep that kept grazing in the rain. Then the Chiras and goats won't have any trouble from this, but mind what I told you from now on. Either get rid of the sheep sorrel or the fungus, or keep animals out of those fields as soon as it starts to rain in the spring." Keisha stretched, easing cramped arm and back muscles. Alice looked around the barn at her contentedly drowsing charges and sighed. I suppose if there's anybody else that needs the space here, we're to make room for them? I won't allow an animal in that has something yours can catch, Keisha assured her. It might happen that we need the room, but this place is big enough that you won't have to vacate. Alice and the other shepherds looked satisfied with that. Alice had something of her own to offer. If someone gets flooded out, remember we have extra beds at the fellowship, all right? It's only fair, with us getting to use the barn and all. I'll tell the mayor, and thanks in advance, Keisha replied. You won't need me any more, so I'd better get back to where people can find me. She waved goodbye to the other shepherds as they settled themselves in for as long as the rain lasted, the dogs making nests in the straw around the flock of sheep. It could be worse for them, Keisha thought, as she faced the storm, bowing her head under the frigid deluge. They could have to watch the sheep out in this mess. At least they'll be warm and dry, even if they do have to feed the oven and haul over fodder and straw. And in the long run, it was a good thing that the sheep were here and not in the field. Only about a quarter of the ewes had lambs at their side. The rest were still all heavily pregnant. Sheep always picked the worst time to lamb, and it was even odds that they'd decide to drop in the middle of the storm. If there were any problems, there wouldn't be any hunting about on storm-drenched hillsides to find the missing ewe. They might not lose any this year if they all decide to drop while they're in the barn. That would be a blessing. When she got back to her workshop, there was a patient waiting for her, huddled in the chair by the fire. And it was Peel, one of Shandy's most romantic and least sensible suitors, who was, if possible, the very last person she wanted to see. She tried not to let her resignation show. No need to ask what brought him, his red nose and swollen eyes, steady sneezing and rasping cough told the whole story. Oh, Peel, she sighed, putting her hands on her hips and shaking her head. You are a right mess, aren't you? I suppose it's my own fault, he wheezed miserably, blowing his nose on his handkerchief. I was out on our hill, and when it started to rain, I was thinking so hard about her that I didn't notice. I promise you that it's all your own fault, she said severely. You are more than old enough to know better than to play a fool's trick like that. And Shandy wouldn't thank you for catching pneumonia and dying. Only idiots in ballads get sick and pine gracefully and painlessly away for love, Peel. I can guarantee that pneumonia takes longer and hurts a lot. But sometimes I think it wouldn't be a bad thing, he said forlornly, his voice trailing off as she turned away and got some of her stronger medicines. Oh, you don't, do you? 
She was not going to let him wallow in self-indulgent misery, not in her workshop. And just how would your parents feel about that? How would Shandi, may I ask? Just how do you think I'd explain that to her, that I let you die of a stupid chill? Idiot! It isn't as if she left you for another suitor, and it isn't as if she flew off to the moon. But she might as well be on the moon, he cried plaintively. Why wasn't it you that was chosen instead of her? Why couldn't it have been you? Nobody's in love with you. I will have none of that nonsense here, she told him briskly, turning around with a particularly nasty-tasting potion in her hand. She was in no mood for any of this, and he had, by the havens, earned a good scold. First off, if I had been chosen, who would be taking care of you this minute? Second, it's none of your business, and nobody asked you who should and should not be chosen. You leave that to the companions. Third, if you're so desperately in love with Shandi, you'd do far better by spending your time thinking of a way to make a good livelihood in Haven, where she is, than sitting around on hills moping. "'showing up in Haven, in a good suit of clothing, "'with the money in your pocket to take her to a fine inn for supper, "'would charm her and finally impress my father. "'Dying stupidly would not, "'and moon-calfing about on hills in the rain "'when other folk are working does not. "'Not that I expect him to exert himself that much,' "'she thought scornfully, "'for she shared her father's opinion of Peel.' The fellow was in love with the idea of being in love, and with bardic notions of romance, not really in love with Shandi. It's easy to lie around on hills and weep, and it impresses other fools with how deep your feelings are. One month from now, he'll be desperately in love with one of Shandi's friends, or one of Lord Breon's maids at the keep. Here, she said abruptly, thrusting the mug at him, drink this, all of it, now. He looked from the mug to her face, saw no hope of reprieve, and gagged it down. It was truly awful, and she'd made no effort to sweeten it. Now go home, get into bed, and sleep, she ordered. When your mother gives you soup and tea, don't play with them, drink them. I know she's already got the medicine she needs for you. She came to get it last night." Peel gave a long-suffering sigh and draped himself with his rain cape as if it were his shroud. She saw him to the door and nobly refrained from slamming it behind him. The rest of the day was spent in dosing similar illnesses and in listening to the complaints of the sufferers. Most of the complaints were actually more fretful and pathetic than anything else. Neighbor Tansy pretty well summed them up when she came for cough syrup. I wish young Darion would get back here and set himself up like he's supposed to, she grumbled. Even if he couldn't have sent this storm elsewhere, he'd at least have been able to warn us about it, and he'd be able to tell us how long it's likely to last. When darkness fell, she finally made a dinner for herself, a good one, not just the soup, but a nice slice of fried ham and some scrambled eggs and toast. The only thing she'd had all day was those seed cakes and a couple of bites of soup in between patients, and she was so hungry she was close to being nauseated. She didn't let her irritation with Peel spoil her meal either, though she'd been damned annoyed with his self-indulgent bleeding. The sheep didn't make that much of a complaint, she told herself, as she took careful sips of the hot soup. And as for that business of why weren't you chosen, nobody is in love with you. Ooh, I could have strangled him if I weren't so tolerant, and he weren't a patient— the rain still hadn't let up, though it had lessened a bit. A storm this big will probably get haven, too. I wonder how Shandi is doing. It was too soon for a letter, but Keisha couldn't help wishing one would come. I wish I had someone else I could talk to. She sighed and took her dishes to the sink to wash. If I'd been chosen, I'd have my companion. Fantasy.
foolishness. There was never a chance that she'd have been chosen. Any hesitation on the part of the companion had been her imagination. Why would any companion choose me, she thought sourly. Not only is nobody in love with me, nobody even likes me. There wasn't a chance that companion would have chosen me. Mum and Da named me right. Keisha, that's me. The tree all over thorns and no fruit worth anybody's effort. If people didn't need me so badly, they'd never come near me. Uncomfortable thoughts, uncomfortable feelings, and she knew if she didn't get her mind off them, she'd sink into a well of self-pity as deep as peels. So she picked up one of her healing texts and put her mind into study, until she was so tired and sore of eye that she practically crawled up the ladder to her bed. After four days, the rain finally stopped. The sun put in a brilliant appearance in cloudless skies, and a dry, warm breeze made colds, or at least complaints of colds, disappear. It never failed to amaze and amuse Keisha that a couple of sunny, warm days in spring or fall could make everyone forget about feeling ill. Unless, of course, they were very ill indeed. Peel did not put in a second appearance, nor was he anywhere in the village when Keisha was about, which either meant he had taken Keisha's lecture to heart and was actively seeking a way to make his living in the greater world, not likely, or that he so feared another tongue-lashing that he wasn't going to come anywhere near her, far more likely. The sheep got over their illness, and there were many more to herd out of the barn than went in, for many of the pregnant ewes took the opportunity to drop lambs. The folk from the fellowship took such good care of the threshing barn that the mayor declared they could make free use of it whenever they had another such emergency. In short, everything was back to normal. Everything but Keisha herself, that is. Since the onset of the storm, she'd felt edgy most of the time. Whenever she treated a patient, she'd start to reflect the emotional state of that patient herself, and it wasn't pleasant. The only reason she'd even known that she was being influenced in that way was because she'd been perfectly calm and contented on the third morning of the storm and had her mood utterly reversed by the first patient to enter the door. Once someone left, she was fine, but while they were in the same area, she had to keep a steady head and remind herself that she was not the one feeling rotten. It was worse if she had to touch the patient. That opened her up to all manner of things she didn't understand and did not in the least like. This was making things unexpectedly uncomfortable at home. Rain made the trip to and from the farm pure misery, made chores at the farm a burden, and kept all the boys in the house when they weren't at the farm. Cooped up like that, for lack of any other amusement, they picked fights with each other. When the boys argued, she found herself getting angry for no reason at all. When her mother got upset, her eyes threatened to overflow— she discovered that beneath her father's calm exterior, he often suffered from a tensely knotted, aching gut by experiencing these things herself. That, at least, was useful. She took him aside and convinced him he needed her help unless he wanted to start spitting up blood one day. At least he stopped suffering and felt immensely calmer after following her prescriptions, even if she didn't. Four days after the storm ended, Lord Brian's healer Gill arrived for his monthly visit. He was late by a day, but she'd expected that. He'd probably had the same sorts of patients that she'd had, maybe more serious, since Lord Brian's men were duty-bound to be outside no matter the weather, and to rescue any of Lord Brian's folk who'd gotten themselves into difficulties. She was replacing her depleted stocks of already prepared medicines when he tapped on the doorframe and walked on in. 
She knew both the tap and the step, and even if she hadn't, she'd have known it was him by the feeling of steadiness and patience that he always brought with him. He might be a cranky curmudgeon on the outside, but inside he was the steady rock on which all hysteria drove itself in vain. At that moment, however, she needed both hands and her eyes to get her comfrey and lobelia concentrate into its jug. Welcome, Gil, she greeted him without turning. Give me a moment, will you? I have both hands full. Gil helped himself to one of the two chairs, and she heard him sit down. Am I? he asked. Am I welcome, that is? Hmm. Is he expecting a fight out of me? If so, why? She put the jug up, then measured her herbs, and put the finished mixture into a steeping bag, tying the drawstrings tight. No point in starting a new batch now, but she'd have it ready to go when Gil left. I haven't killed anyone this month, directly or indirectly, and I don't have any plans to do so today, so of course you're welcome, she retorted, turning to greet him properly. Mind you, I was tempted once or twice during the rain, but I managed to contain my feelings. Gil was a withered little raisin of a man whose normal movements were so deliberate that it shocked people when, in an emergency, he moved with the speed of a hummingbird. His hair was an iron gray, his legs bowed, his eyes small and black, and seemingly able to see whatever it was you most wanted to keep secret. He didn't look like a healer. He looked like a weather-beaten old horse tamer, and, in fact, he did tame horses using a Shinayin method he'd learned on Lord Ashkevron's estate of forced reach where he'd grown up, where horse tamers were honored and very truly needed. Children and animals trusted him immediately, and he had the no-nonsense aura of competence and authority to make even Lord Breon's most battle-hardened fighters listen to and obey him. There couldn't have been a better healer for that particular position in the entire kingdom, even if his gift was so weak it was negligible. I see you're wearing greens now, so to speak, he continued, raising his eyebrows. Not exactly orthodox color, though. She brushed her hand down the front of her tunic self-consciously. I thought I'd use some old clothing of my own for a dye experiment before I ruined those nice uniforms the Collegium sent. She shrugged. Why use those new uniforms for work when I have plenty of old things that can take a beating? You know, a uniform isn't there to make you conform. It's to reassure your patients as a symbol. Heralds know that. That's why they wear whites. People wouldn't take them half so seriously if they didn't show up in uniforms. I take it that with the rains you had the usual crop? he asked, looking her up and down, still with that penetrating expression on his face. And one young idiot, she replied with a laugh, and sat down and told him about Peel. He grunted with disgust when she described how Peel had gotten sick and soaked in the first place, and broke into a cackle of unexpected laughter when she told him the lecture she'd read The Romantic Fool. "'Bright havens! I wish I'd been here!' he chortled, slapping the arm of the chair with his hand. "'Sounds to me as if you're getting your proper attitude, young lady. If people won't give you the authority and respect you need to make them listen, then by the gods, take it. You can apologize after they're better.' What good's a healer that no one listens to? That was where poor old Justin got into trouble. He was too soft on people. Well, all I can say is I'm grateful that Peel hasn't decided he's life-bonded to Shandy. He's quite enough of a wet mess as it is, and I swear to you, even if he was shaved bald, he'd have more hair than wits. Why Shandy ever encouraged him in the first place, I'll never know. 
She sighed and ran both hands through the hair at her temples in exasperation. Maybe it's just that she was too kind and afraid to break his heart. Other than young Teal's crisis, the Fellowship's sheep got that dry cough I told you about, and the preparation you recommended cleared it up in them as fast as it did my folks' flock. Just watch that particular medicine in the early stages of pregnancy. It tends to make cattle miscarry, and it might do the same in sheep, he cautioned. Late stages, no problem. But the first month, if it's a choice between possibly losing the sheep or losing the lamb, I think most people would prefer the latter. But I'll be sure and give them that option if the situation comes up, she promised. But that might be the reason why so many of the pregnant ones decided to drop lambs in the barn, which was a fine thing as far as their keepers were concerned. Heard anything from your sister yet? he asked, changing the subject so quickly that she immediately suspected an ulterior motive. She shook her head. It's a little too soon, I think, she replied, watching him with care. I should think they'd have her so busy at first that she'd be going from the moment she got up to the moment her head hit the pillow. I wonder why he's asking. Is it curiosity or something more? And I should think she'd want her sister with her so much that she'd be sending you letters three times a day, he began. She held up her hand, stopping him at that point. Don't start, she said shortly. I won't listen, and we've been through this a hundred times. How would you cope with me gone? You couldn't, and you know it. But you have the gift, and I can't teach you to use it, he countered stubbornly. We've tried, and I can't tell you what you need to know, and so far you haven't made any progress with the texts either. Then we'll wait until someone with the gift can come here to teach me for a couple of months, she retorted, just as stubbornly. Right now I'm doing as well or better than Justin did for all of his training at the Collegium, and right now that's what this village needs and can't afford to do without. Whatever happens here, I can at least buy time for a fully trained, fully gifted healer to get here. And you have to admit that in some cases, that's all you could do. Gill shook his head, but he gave up the argument as a lost cause yet again. He was silent for a space, then scratched his head uneasily. I'm just afraid that if you keep on like this, your gift is going to get you into trouble, he said at last, sounding far more worried than she was used to hearing from him. How... How could I get into trouble? she asked, uncomfortably certain that she already knew the answer. I'm not sure. Since my own gift is so trifling, they never went into details, he said, frowning with concentration, probably as he tried to recall his long-ago training at the Collegium. I just remember that they told me an untrained gift has the potential to cause the owner problems. She wondered guiltily if she ought to tell him about her strange new sensation, and how her nerves always seem to be raw and open to other people. But if I do, he'll probably find a way to pack me off to Haven, and then what would happen? No, I can get through this. It can't be too long now before someone is sent here to show me what to do. Half the healers in Valdemar aren't trained at the Collegium, and they do all right. I can manage. I have to. To keep him from somehow getting the information out of her, she took him around to see those few of her patients who were still abed, and the now healthy flock of fellowship sheep. The fellowship had put them in a pasture along the edge of the river, an easy walk from the village, and quite an enjoyable stroll in the warm spring sunshine. A feeling of laziness crept over her as they came up to the fence and propped their arms up on the top rail, the wood rough and warm under her hand. 
He leaned over the fence, looking as relaxed as she had ever seen him, watching the silly beasts graze and wearing a small but contented smile. I have to admit something to you, young Keisha, he said at last, after they'd both listened to a woodlark sing until it flew off. I envy you this part of your practice, and I am very glad that you aren't one of those who thinks herself too valuable to waste time tending animals. If one of those ever gets around me, they'll get an earful, she chuckled, totally relaxed now that the only human anywhere around was her mentor. If our job is to see to our people's well-being, how can we ignore the well-being of their animals? If their beasties fail, they'll starve. And how have we done our duty then? Good point, and one I'll remember the next time I need it. One of the sheep looked up at them, and for some reason known only to it, decided to come over to the fence to see what they were doing there. Gill reached over the fence to the animal, let it sniff his fingers, then buried his hand in its woolly head, scratching around its ears. The sheep went cross-eyed with bliss, and Keisha giggled at its expression. The shepherds tell me they've always been marvelously tame, but it's been really pronounced since the rain, she told the healer. I think they were reminded that many of them grew up in boxes next to warm stoves, so now they're almost like pets, which makes me glad they're wool sheep and not mutton sheep. There is something to that, he agreed. Seems like a betrayal to raise a creature as a pet, then eat it. Most chickens being an exception, of course. Keisha laughed. She'd been pecked by too many hens and chased by too many mean roosters to disagree with him. Most chickens can't be pets. They've got less brains than peel, if that's possible, she pointed out. Since you've got your fingers in it, what do you think of the wool in its natural state? Why do you think I'm scratching her? It's as much for my pleasure as hers. I don't think I've ever felt anything so soft. He finally stopped his ministrations with a gentle pat on the top of the sheep's head, just as well, for the ewe looked ready to fall over at any moment. He looked her over with a measuring gaze as she shook her head until her ears flapped, then went back to grazing. Just about shearing time, isn't it? Just about. The fellowship always waits until they're sure the cold weather is over before they take that protection away. I've told you how delicate this lot is. Yes, but obviously worth it. The shawls wouldn't be half so desirable, made out of ordinary fleece. That reminds me, Lord Brion's son Val plans to pick out a shawl this midsummer fair, or so Lord Brion tells me, Gill offered. He caught Keisha's interest immediately. If the son and heir of their liege lord was getting married, the whole village would want to know all about it and as soon as might be. For whom, she asked, anyone we know? Some sweet young thing at the keep where he fostered until this spring, Gill chuckled. I've got the notion that Lord Brion had that in mind when he fostered Val there in the first place. With eight daughters to choose from, there was bound to be something that would take. I'll tell the fellowship about the shawl first, Keisha replied, already deciding who she'd tell first and in what order so as not to upset the delicate ranking order in the village. They'll probably want to do something special for Val, and they'll want every moment of time to plan it. Yes, do that, but I won't tell him they're making a special shawl for him. He's got it set in his mind that he has to pick the thing out— as if there's a special magic to what he'd pick only he and she would appreciate properly, or some other romantic nonsense. Gill shook his head. He's been listening to a lot of love ballads lately. He and that lovelorn lad of yours have that much in common. Sometimes I think bards do more harm than good. Well, 
They give us all something to dream about, I suppose, she said doubtfully, then returned to the practical aspects of the courtship. Meanwhile, I think we can all arrange that he gets his special shawl without knowing it's his special shawl, if that makes any sense. Complete sense! He looked up at the sun and pushed away from the fence. And if I'm to get back before sundown, I'd best collect my horse and be on my way. They parted amiably enough at the pasture, and Keisha returned to the haven of her workshop. She still had plenty more to do, while there was a relative lack of illness and injury, and just now nothing would tempt her back into the proximity of people. She felt relaxed, and she wanted to hold on to the feeling as long as she could. She truly dreaded having to go back home. Lately, at least one of the boys would have some sort of unpleasant dream each night, and although the dreamer never woke up and never remembered the dream, she did, and it woke her up. The workshop was far enough away from the rest of the houses that nothing ever reached her here, and it would be so good to go to sleep knowing that the only thing disturbing her would be her own nightmares, if any. It would be so nice to have a good night's sleep again, the way I did during the rains, she thought fretfully. I wish I could just live here and be done with it. Then, I wonder why I couldn't just do that. She abruptly sat down in the chair Gill had used. All right, I'll be methodical. The reasons why it would be difficult are Mum would object, firstly. True enough, but she could point out that now no one else would get roused in the middle of the night just because someone needed her. Besides, it wasn't as if she were going to be living out at the farm or somewhere else out of sight and alone. She'd still be near at hand, quite near enough to keep an eye on. I'd have to start doing my own meals. Yes, but she did that sometimes anyway. The memory of the fellowship's communal meals popped into her head, and she realized that she could easily trade some of the routine health care of their flocks for the right to eat with them. Other than that, she could start taking a little more of her fees in food barter. It could all be worked out. I'd be by myself. Mum will say that people might talk. Now, if it had been Shandi who'd wanted to live in the workshop, that would have caused a scandal. Shandi was pretty and had suitors, and people would certainly start to gossip. For this purpose, Keisha's prickly personality gave her all the protection she needed, for there wasn't a young man in the entire village who had ever showed any interest in courting her, and they surely wouldn't start just because she was living alone. And what's more, Rafe can move into the cubby Shandi and I shared, and that will break up the quarreling with Tori. For that reason alone, Papa will back me up on this. But it was easiest to get something done if you didn't stop to ask permission first. So before anyone came home from the farm, she decided to get all her things and move them over to the workshop. Move now and argue about it later. She went straight home, and working quickly, had everything she could truly call hers piled on both beds. Clothing, of course, that was the largest pile. The carved wooden box Papa had made to hold her jewelry was on top of the pile of underthings. She ran her fingers over the smooth wood of the top, following the familiar course of the curls and whirls he'd incised there. Beside that were her two dolls. All the rest of her toys had been handed down to her brothers as she outgrew them. One was a faceless, battered, and much beloved rag doll, worn out with loving and much play, but too much adored to be discarded. Beth had been the subject of many an adventure, many a peril, and so much hugging that the stuffing was permanently squeezed out of her middle. 
She had been rescued by Harold's and Hawk Brothers from every hazard imaginable, from forest fires to slavers. Then, as Keisha's interest in healing strengthened and grew, had not only been rescued, but had been cured of every illness and injury possible, and some that would have been the death of any lesser creature. Her embroidered mouth was stained with all the potions that had been pressed to it, her goat hair braids a little matted from the compresses tied to her head, and every limb had been stitched and re-stitched with sutures for imagined wounds. Keisha gave her a self-conscious little kiss and put her down again. The other doll, an immaculate and beautiful porcelain-headed lady doll that she and Shandi used to practice on when they were first learning sewing skills, was in near-new condition, for Anastasia had been a gift to a much older Keisha than Beth. In fact, Shandi and Keisha still used this doll to work out a new cut for a gown or the like. She picked it up and smoothed down the folds of the last gown they'd sewn for it, a dainty creation for Shandi on the occasion of her being chosen Harvest Queen last fall. Of course, the doll's gown was a patchwork of scraps with a network of chalk lines and other marks on it, which gave the gown a rather odd look. But Shandi had looked like real royalty. Yes, both dolls would definitely have to come. They could share the loft with her bed. That way, no one would see them and tease her about them, and Beth could reassure hurt little ones. Next, basket of toiletries. Scent, lotions, the cosmetics she and Shandi had created that Mum would have had a fit over had she known about them. No doubt there, these had better come too. At least now she'd have some privacy to experiment with those cosmetics without anybody finding out. And if Mum discovered them, I hate to think what a scene it would cause— all of the extra sheets and blankets came next, but there was really no need to take them. I'll leave the bedding. I've enough at the workshop, and if I need more, I can barter for it. She stowed it all under the bed where it had been kept before. Embroidery basket, knitting basket, plain sewing basket, all of her handicrafts stored in baskets, making them portable enough to take along anywhere. Shandi had come up with that idea, and now Shandi's baskets were somewhere between here and Haven in a peddler's wagon. Yes, yes, and yes, I'm still going to need my baskets. I've got all that wool to knit up if I want a new sweater this winter. A pile of fabric, which had mostly been Shandi's choices, but which Shandi was hardly going to need now, seeing as how she would spend the next several years wearing trainee greys exclusively. Keisha had kept the pile of fabric when she'd sent on Shandi's clothing and handiwork baskets. Will I have time to do any sewing for myself? Well, probably and colors that suited Shandi would also suit Keisha. True, the fabrics would do for new shirts for the boys, but when was Mum going to have time to sew them? She hesitated, then added the pile of fabric to the growing list of things she was taking. I have plenty of things that I can wear to work in, but not much else. It might be nice to have a pretty gown or so. Rag bag. Definitely. No one can have too many rags. The big box of odds and ends she was always meaning to do something with. Brilliant feathers, a cured snakeskin, seeds that looked as if they might make good beads, half-finished bits of carving and crafting. Maybe I'll get some of that done. Eventually, she had it all sorted through, and decided that three trips would do to get it all to the workshop. On the second, neighbor Tansy came outside with a basket of wet clothing and looked at her with a surprised expression. Keisha, she called, before Keisha could escape out of earshot. Have you fought with your parents over something? Is something wrong? Why are you moving? Keisha paused and peered around her burden, licked her lips nervously, and said, We haven't quarreled, but 
Tansy, with Shandy gone, the house is just too small to hold all those boys and just me. Besides, I'm in the shop more than I'm here. Tansy looked relieved and nodded. That's the truth, and I've been saying to my Olek that you must feel like a kickball in there with all those rowdy boys and no Shandy to make them behave like gentlemen. Well, good. As long as you haven't gone and had a fight with your mum or da, I'll remember you're on your own and bring you over a bite to eat now and again. Keisha flushed and smiled. Thank you, Tansy. That's more than I'd expect. Oh, it's no more than we did or should have done for Wizard Justin, bless his brave soul. She waved her hand vaguely in the direction of the statue in the square. I won't keep you, dear, and I hope you enjoy a night without having to listen to your brothers for a change. Oh, Tansy, Keisha laughed. They snore so loudly, I'll probably still hear them. When she returned for the third load, Tansy was back inside her house, and she brought over the last of her things with a feeling of profound relief. The relief deepened into pure content as she stowed her belongings away, clothing into the clothes chest in the loft and the wardrobe cupboard downstairs, fabric up on a shelf where it wouldn't get dirty, one work basket in the window seat, one in the loft, and one beside the fire. The dolls sat side by side in state on her bed, and all the rest of her possessions fitted into nooks and corners as if they'd belonged there all along. Now it looked like a home. Her samplers and embroidered tapestries were on the wall. A lap rug lay over the back of the fireplace chair. Embroidered cushions softened seats, and her blue glass vase sat on the tiny table where she ate her meals. And it was hers, all hers, with the stamp of no other hands on it. Wizard Justin would never recognize the place, she thought happily. Not that she had ever seen it when Justin was in residence, but some of the village women had given very succinct and pungent descriptions. They all boiled down to one word, one which made a world of sense to women, though it baffled men. Bachelors. Justin had been a bachelor, and an old one at that. Bachelors didn't clean up after themselves for some unknown reason, nor did they really allow anyone else to clean up after them. The place would have been a right mess when Justin lived here, with shelves crammed full of dusty oddments, clothing lying about on the floor or draped over a chair where the wizard had left it, and dirty crockery filling the sink. Now every perfectly straight and level shelf held its proper contents arrayed sensibly, the big table that had taken up most of the space was gone, replaced by her tiny table, a short stool, and a couple of comfortable chairs. A tall stool stood beside her clean, orderly workbenches. The floor was swept, the hearth clean, and enough firewood to take care of the fire for the entire evening stacked in a log holder beside it. Kindling was in a bucket beside that, not scattered across the hearth. The biggest of the two windows had been deepened, and a window seat built into it. Her embroidered wind rider hung over the hearth, her first and second samplers on either side of it, and her moon lady up in the loft over the window. Braided rag rugs softened and warmed the floor. All the food was stored out of sight in a closed and mouse-proof cupboard. There wasn't a crumb to tempt mouse or insect anywhere to be seen. On the domestic side of the cottage, shelves were laden with her personal books, handiwork, linens, and other purely personal belongings. Here the wardrobe and cupboard resided. On the healer side, shelves were burdened with more books, prepared medicines, raw materials, bandages, the knives and probes, needles and taledras silk and catgut of her trade. This was where the workbenches were, and the sink with its pump. 
The fireplace divided the two sides, and beside it was a rolled-up pallet where she could treat anyone who couldn't stand or needed sewing up. That way the victim couldn't thrash around and fall off a table or bed, and what was more important to her, if he was delirious or uncooperative, she could sit on him to hold him still if she had to. Acres and acres, and it's mine, all mine, she giggled, remembering the punchline to a salacious joke she wasn't supposed to have overheard. Everything was as neat and clean as soap and water could get it, including the loft where her bed was. And that, of course, would be another change. I remember when we cleaned this place up, dirt had actually packed into the corners. Still, that was a little uncharitable, for Justin had kept his own treatment areas clean. It was just that, well... Bachelors don't seem to realize that dirt gets under things and into corners where you can't see it. Bachelors think that as long as it's not gritty underfoot, the floor's clean. It was time to think about making supper. Or going to talk to the fellowship. I think I'll be lazy. As she closed the door behind her, she realized that there was something gone from her. Resentment and another thing, a feeling of being desperately crowded. It's because now I don't have to share anything. That's what it is. Not the wash basin, not the chores, not a room. Bright havens. I can choose to share. I don't have to. I'm going to have privacy, real and total privacy. She couldn't remember having had complete privacy in her entire life. It was such an astonishing thought that she couldn't think of anything else right up until the moment that she knocked on the door of the Fellowship's Hall, their main building. She recognized the old man who answered the door as the eldest, not really a leader, but the oldest man of the founding family, the grandfather of Alice. As such, he had the authority to make simple bargains for the fellowship, such as the one she had in mind, without putting it to a vote. Eldest Saphir, she said, with a half bow, I have a proposition I would like to put to you. Then please enter, Healer, he told her, his expression carefully neutral. She entered and followed him into the communal hall where they all took their meals. At his invitation, she sat down on a bench. He sat on one opposite her. "'May I hear your proposition, healer?' he asked politely. "'I cannot say yet if I may consider it alone, or the fellowship as a whole must debate it.' "'I understand that, eldest,' she replied, just as soberly. "'It is a minor proposal, and simple.' The fellowship currently owes me for certain medicines and treatment for the sheep during the rains. I should like to barter that credit for a certain number of meals taken with you. The old man's brows had furrowed during the first part of her statement, but rose to his hairline in surprise as she finished. Don't you have your own family? he blurted. I have irregular hours, and it came to me today that we have far too many people stuffed into a single small house, she said with a smile. We all agree that I am fully adult, so I moved into my workshop to free some space for my brothers. Since I will no longer be contributing to the family income, it seems wrong to take bread from their table. I can see that. He pondered the proposal while she waited patiently. And I am certain that you already know of our custom of the hearth kettle. Actually, eldest, she smiled, I was counting on it. The hearth kettle was a kettle of soup or stew, always kept on the kitchen hearth, so that anyone who was hungry could be fed. One of the fellowship's customs was that anyone who begged charity was granted three meals and a place to sleep, with nothing in return asked of him. And the kettle also served a useful purpose for people whose lives were built around their animals, and who thus, at certain seasons, would also have irregular hours. 
Keisha could always count on getting a bite from the hearth kettle, day or night. Well, then, now the old man smiled broadly, and Keisha knew she'd won him over. What if I say that we will barter unlimited meals in return for all routine care, not emergencies or unexpected illnesses, like the sheep just had, but all the routine health checks and medicines and tonics and so forth? She saw no point in bargaining further. This was exactly what she wanted. Then I would say that the bargain is set. She held out her hand. He took it and shook it three times to seal the bargain. Will you stay for tonight's dinner? We've egg pie. He raised his eyebrows again. My wife also's egg pie. She sighed happily at the mere suggestion and smiled at him. Eldest, she said with complete truth, for your wife's egg pie, I would arm wrestle a bear. She returned to her cottage, her cottage, not her workshop anymore, and the mere thought filled her with proprietary pride. Carrying a basket of warm rolls for breakfast, and with the satisfied content of having had a truly fine meal, Ulsa had a way with spicing and adding chopped bacon and greens to egg pie that raised the humble dish to something suitable for the table of the queen herself. There could not have been a better omen for the start of her bargain with the fellowship than that first meal. She put the rolls away and lit two of her lamps, then went out into the garden to cut a few blooms for her vase. With lamps shining brightly and flowers on the table, she felt happier than she had for months. And instead of studying, tonight she gave herself a holiday of sorts— with a small fire to warm the room, she picked up her knitting. With luck, she'd finish the back of the tunic tonight. That would leave the front and both sleeves to do before winter, which was hardly an insurmountable task. She listened to the songs of crickets and tree frogs, the murmur of voices in the houses nearest hers, and the distant rushing of the river. There were no shouting boys, no clumping boots, nothing but peaceful quiet. Why didn't I do this sooner? I'd have had far fewer headaches. Perhaps because Shandi had kept peace in the house, or as much peace as anyone could. But surely at some point even Shandi had gotten tired of playing peacekeeper. Maybe that's one reason why she was so ready to ride off to Haven. That, and Mum... Mum didn't really want her to grow up, I think. Poor Mum. Like it or not, children do, and there's nothing to be done about it. So it could be that Shandi had done both of them a favor by making the break clean and quick. Yes, and me too. If Shandi's grown up, I'm more than grown. Was this how Shandi felt now, on her own, making her own decisions, having a place she could truly say was hers and no one else's? If so, Keisha was glad for her. It was a fine feeling, and one she would be glad to share. I hope she has a room of her own at that collegium place. She certainly deserves one at this point. She'd always been an early riser, more from necessity than virtue. It was true, but a healer didn't have much choice in the matter, and it had been a long day. She found herself yawning over her work just as she bound off the knitting and realized that there were no noisy boys to keep her awake if she tried to go to sleep early. She lit a lantern in the loft, blew out the two downstairs, and banked the fire for the morning. As she went back up to the loft to change for bed, she sent a silent prayer of thanks to whatever deity had put this notion of moving into her mind. And if it's the spirit of Wizard Justin, who didn't want his cottage to stand empty most of the time, thank you too. Once the hurdle of breaking the news to her mother was over and done with, the move was going to make life easier, much 
much easier. Now, if the mysterious Darion would just return to care for the magical needs of Erald's Grove, life here would be just about perfect. Six. Once, back when he was enduring his lessons with Justin, Darion would have been conscious of nothing except how uncomfortable he was at this moment, either too hot or too cold, sitting on a rock or on a sharp branch. He could always find something to distract him from his hated lessons in magic, lessons he considered useless. That was a long time ago, far distant in time and maturity, or so he hoped. Now, none of those possible discomforts mattered, and if you asked him about the temperature or his surroundings, he'd tell you honestly that he hadn't noticed. Especially at this moment, a moment of epiphanal breakthrough, when intense new experience overwhelmed every other consideration. There, said Healer Mage Firefrost in triumph, now you see it, you feel it, don't you? Darion stared at the slow, smooth flow of energy that was literally all around him, it had taken days of coaching, but now, at last, he was able to do what Starfall had not been able to teach him, was in the overworld of energy, a world overlying the real world and a part of it, yet with its own separate life and rules. He used mage sight at a deep enough level to actually watch the passage of life energy from living creatures to the tiny feeder lines, and from there to the ley lines and on to the nodes. Every mage knew that energy flowed in that way. It was one of the first lessons in energy control, but only certain types of mages could actually see it happen at the level of individual blades of grass and insects no bigger than pinheads. Most mages couldn't actually detect mage energy until it had collected in the thread-like initial runnels, leaving them with the impression that the energy took the form of a web rather than an all-pervasive flow. More than that, as Firefrost said, he felt it, a sensation entirely new to him and yet as familiar to him as his own heartbeat, exactly like the faint pressure of sunlight on his skin. Healers saw and felt the same thing according to Starfall. So did minor mages like earth witches and hedge wizards. These were the energies that they used, for they were unable to handle anything with more power than a small runnel. This energy was tedious to accumulate and granted them a relatively low level of power, but it was omnipresent. An earth witch never had to search for a ley line, and for a while after the mage storms, hedge wizards could accomplish more than adepts, who had never been forced to learn all of the minor magics that needed only the merest whisper of power. Experimentally, he moved to one of the little runnels collecting the flow, nowhere near large enough to be called a ley line, and sensed the pressure increase when he interposed himself in the flow. It feels good, doesn't it? Firefrost said with satisfaction. I always think it feels like bathing in sun-warmed silk. He nodded absently. It both felt and looked good, a warm amber glow, the exact color of the light near sunset on a cloudless summer evening, and a sensation of being slowly revitalized. If you go somewhere that the energies are distorted or marred, you'll feel that as well, Firefrost told him. It will make you sick, and you'll learn to tell what's wrong by how it affects you. Right now, you need most to learn to snap in and out of mage sight and mage sense accurately and infallibly, so that if you ever do come across such a place, it won't entrap you. Now that you have the trick of seeing this level, your assignment will be to practice exactly that until I think you're ready for the next step. 
Can the good magic entrap you too, with not wanting to leave that feeling? He asked. Not if you're mentally healthy. No more than you're entrapped at the feast table, she replied. Once you're full, you'll feel willing to leave. The mage did something. Darion couldn't quite tell what it was, but it felt a little like a static spark arcing from the mage to himself, more of a shock than pain, but enough to bring him back to the ordinary world with a startled gasp. This is why you need a healing adept to teach you properly, Firefrost said, still sitting serenely where she'd been all along, cross-legged in the shade at the edge of the meadow where he and Kel had picnicked. Starfall is a fine mage, experienced and full of wisdom, but he cannot see and sense the earth energies in the way a healer mage can. He cannot move about in the realm of pure energy the way we can, so he could not teach you how to access them. I am a healer mage, but I can only take you so far. You have the potential to become a healing adept, and your teacher should also be at that level if you are going to reach that potential. Darion nodded. He also sat where he had been all along. His movement in the overworld of energies had all been with something other than his physical body. I think I know why you brought me here, too, he said shrewdly. Even though most of the mages have been teaching me in the safety of the veil, if I'd made the breakthrough there, I'd probably have been blinded. Firefrost beamed at him. Her young, old face suddenly wreathed in the wrinkles of her proper age, well over seventy. Smile lines, mostly. Firefrost was a very cheerful person. Very good. Yes, and I advise you to practice and learn to control this type of sight in a safe place outside the veil until you've gotten it well in hand. So many ley lines come into the heartstone in the veil that you would be blinded if you can't dim things down for yourself, and you'd have a headache for a week that would make you wish you were dead. Darion was still conscious of that faint pressure of energy. He realized that he always had been. He just hadn't known what to call it. So this is why some places in Valdemar made me sick until we cleaned them up, he said wonderingly. That's why Snowfire and Starfall would watch me so closely. They couldn't feel where things had gone wrong, and they used me to find the places for them. Firefrost nodded, and her approval warmed him clear through. And you understand why they had to do that, don't you? Or now are you feeling misused? That was the last thing on his mind. He shrugged. They didn't have much choice, did they? I mean, they did have a kind of choice. They could have used dousing or some other way to find the bad places, but it was so much quicker to use me. And besides that, it didn't cost them anything in magical energies of their own. They wouldn't have risked me if they didn't think that we could all do what we did without any harm to me. He couldn't resent being used, not after the way he'd been vehemently angry with them over using up energies they could ill afford in order to accomplish things that he had been able to do at far less expense. He'd essentially offered himself for whatever need they had at that point, so there was no reason to resent the fact that they'd taken him up on the offer. This, this form of the gift that you have, is very similar to the earth sense of some monarchs, Firefrost went on in her low, age-roughened voice. They can't actually see the energies most of the time, not unless they are also mages. But they feel them. They can also feel what is wrong with the energies of their land at a distance, which can be very useful. The monarchs of Rethwellen have it. The highest of the priests of Vicandis have it. The son of the sun Solaris has it. And the new king of Hardorn has it. In the King of Hardorn's case, though, it was, 
imposed on him. With his consent, though I sometimes think he didn't know what he was consenting to. She raised an ironic eyebrow. There is an ancient earth religion sect of that land that still retains the full knowledge of the earth-taking ceremony and has managed to give earth sense to every monarch of Hardorn except the late and unlamented Ankar. Will I be able... Scratch that. I will be able to do what Starfall did about cleaning places up, but faster and more easily, won't I? He made it a statement, but was pleased to see Firefrost nod. It'll be like healing for a healer. Instead of having to figure out what's gone wrong, I'll already know by how it affects me, and because of that, I'll know how to fix what's wrong and get it right the first time, instead of fumbling around using trial and error. It will be quite natural to you, as will some other things, such as moving and acting in the overworld of mage energies, once you've gotten the proper instructor, and you will be able to accomplish things I can only watch and admire, if you ever have access to enough energy. Firefrost sighed. Still, we all have our abilities, and— and anyone who can reverse the effects of frostbite has no reason to feel self-conscious, he replied, daring to interrupt her. Any healer can save what there is left of the damaged tissue, and so could most mages, but anyone who can restore and rebuild all the damage that has already occurred has nothing to be ashamed of. That was how Firefrost had gotten her use name at the age of fourteen, when she was newly come into her abilities. While she was scouting the boundaries of Kevala, a blizzard too huge to be steered away had swept across the forest, and everyone who could was out scouting for those who might have been caught in it. She had been the only person, anything like a healer, to come upon a family of Tervardi, taken by surprise by the storm. She had not only saved them from freezing, but had almost completely reversed the effects of the profoundly crippling frostbite, or fire frost in the Hawk Brother tongue, that they had suffered. By the time the help she had called for arrived, most of the damage was healed, and no one suffered anything worse than a little superficial scarring at the extremities. I sometimes suspect that the only reason I could was that I didn't know I couldn't, his teacher said, only half in jest. Still, still, a little magic used with precision and at precisely the right time is better than a great deal of magic used sloppily and clumsily, too late or too early, he said firmly. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Very well. The student rightly rebukes the teacher. Firefrost laughed, throwing up her hands as if to fend off a blow. Now, I would like to see if the student can evoke his mage sight in the realm of the overworld without the coaching of his teacher. I hear and obey, he said, bowing a little at the waist, and sent his mind down that peculiar twist that Firefrost had shown him. Once again, the world around him was overlaid with the overworld of energies. This time he had a kind of double vision, with the real world showing through the flowing energy fields, and he decided to see if he could narrow his focus. Even as he thought that, in a dizzying rush that felt exactly as if he were diving off a cliff into the river, he found himself contemplating the life forces of a single blade of grass, except that he was far, far smaller in perception than that blade of grass. Oh, my! The slender stem loomed over him like one of the great trees of the Vale, as he gazed upward, his mouth falling open, he tried to take in the immense complexity of this seemingly insignificant bit of flora, and failed. I think my brain is overflowing. He tried to break free of the fascination, and couldn't, tried again, and still couldn't, and gave a wordless cry for help to his teacher. 
With another of those startling shocks, he found himself looking only at the real world again, from his proper perspective, and sighed with relief. Next time, ask before you do something like that, Firefrost told him sternly, crossing her arms over her chest and giving him a harsh glare. That was not what I asked you to do, was it? I didn't know I was doing it until I'd done it, he admitted shakily. She shook her head, the fine silver hair escaping from its braids with the movement and floating in flyaway strands about her face. Now you see why you need a healing adept to teach you. It's entirely possible that you could get yourself into something that I can't get you out of. In the future, tell me what you think you want to do before you're in the overworld, all right? With someone of your potential, a wish often becomes fact before you have the least idea what's going on. He felt very tired all at once, and certainly he and Firefrost had put in more than enough work for one day. It had taken all afternoon before he'd learned that twist that brought him into the overworld. Can we stop now? he asked meekly. I'm getting worn out. Firefrost lost her stern glare and smiled ruefully, and so you should be, and it's my fault for letting you go back in when I knew you would be getting tired. Just run through those primary exercises I showed you, and we'll go back to the Vale. Now that he knew what they were for, the primary exercises in energy manipulation were far easier than they'd been earlier this afternoon, and he ran through them accurately, if not quickly. For the last one, he guided energy from the tree he sat beneath to a particular runnel, rather than allowing it to flow into several as it would normally have done, and this time nothing escaped his herding. Clean, Firefrost approved. Very clean. I couldn't have done it better. Let's get ourselves back home, shall we? He got to his feet and aided Firefrost to hers. She was as much Starfall's senior as Starfall was Darion's, and until Darion arrived, the only healing mage that Kevala had. She had greeted his arrival with relief and pleasure when she learned his potential. She was the kindest and most patient of his three teachers, although Starfall ran a very near second. If his unknown healing adept teacher was half as easy to get along with as Firefrost, Darion thought he would count himself lucky. The other teacher, adept Darkstone, was much more difficult to like. He gave Darion his full attention, true, and was absolutely punctilious in giving Darion the most precise and accurate instructions, but it was all done without any feeling whatsoever. Darion still didn't know a thing about Darkstone's background, not even something so minor as which tree his ekele was in, and he'd been getting lessons from the adept for a week the one thing that he did know was the single thing Darkstone made clear at the very beginning. The adept was entirely against the idea of working with Valdemarans in any way. He did not want outsiders in the Vale, around the Vale, or even aware that the Vale existed. He wanted Hawk Brothers to be a frightening presence in the forest, a glimpse of eyes in a shadow, the warning arrow out of nowhere. Darkstone wasn't the only Taledras who felt that way, though all the ones that Darion had met so far had treated him with distant courtesy at least. There was, after all, a tradition of Taledras accepting the occasional outsider into their ranks and clans. The thing that this particular faction opposed was the wholesale adoption of Valdemar on the same basis as the Kaledain. Hard as it was to believe, there was even a faction that didn't want the Kaledain in Kevala Vale. Their reasoning was a bit obtuse, along the line that, if the goddess had wanted Keleshia back with the Taledras, the goddess would have led them to us after the sundering. 
useless to argue that this was precisely what had happened, if a bit later than they would have preferred. This lot no more wanted Trondiran and griffins in Taledras Vales than they wanted Shinayin and their fighting mares in Taledras Vales. Fortunately, Firefrost was as amused by them as they were outraged by her, and she had power and seniority in the council over most of them. Even if she didn't, she could probably reduce them to gibbering just by chuckling at them, tickling them under the chin, and telling them to run along and learn to play nicely with the new children. He began to see that there were a lot of advantages to age, some of them enough to provide compensation for losing some of the advantages of youth. In deference to Firefrost's age, they'd ridden here on a pair of Daihili, rather than hiking on foot. The two does had wandered off somewhere, but Kuari had kept track of one, while Firefrost's snow-white peregrine had followed the other. Now, without prompting, the birds came winging back, flying under the level of the branches, while the Daihili does sauntered along behind at a brisk walk. Darion offered his linked hands to Firefrost. With a half-bow of her own, she stepped into them, and he boosted her into the well-padded saddle, then hopped on to the other waiting doe. Firefrost avoided the elaborate robes some of the mages, Darkstone for one, liked to wear, and the intricate hairstyles as well. Long, easy-fitting tunics and loose trues of silks in simple colors were what she preferred, and she kept her hair in two braids or a coiled braid at the nape of her neck. Today she wore green with a necklet of rainbow moonstones, a single white primary from her bird fastened into her braids. The other day someone asked me why I hadn't changed my name for a use name, he told her, as they rode side by side. I told them it was because I felt like the same person. Does that make sense to you? Perfectly sound, good sense, she replied with a laugh. Really, Darion, the reason we change our use names in the first place is because the ones we're given as children don't fit us when we become adults. Think about the use names for the children you've heard. Blue Feather, Little Flower, Honey Fawn, Jump Frog. Who'd want to be saddled with something like that as an adult? Huh. Or as an adolescent, he countered, from the lofty vantage of eighteen. So, how do people get their adult use names? Yours was given to you, right? Yes, and if you manage to do something notable at about the time you're ready for an adult use name, that's usually what you get. Sometimes you get tagged with something notable that happens when you're ready for a new name. Her eyes crinkled at the corners with amusement. That's how Starfall got his. It was at a midsummer celebration, and he'd climbed to the top of a cliff, overshadowing the main swimming pool at the Vale we had back then. This was on a dare, you see, the usual male foolishness over a girl, and he jumped from the cliff into the pool at precisely the same time as an extremely bright shooting star flashed overhead, mirroring his fall, even to the same angle. So, starfall he became and has remained. Her eyes crinkled up even more. And the funniest thing about it is that because he was diving at the time and had all of his attention on the dive so that he wouldn't break his silly neck, he never saw the falling star that gave him his name. Steel mind? He never forgets anything and proved it by reciting to one of the elders a speech he had made that was precisely contradictory to the position he supported at that moment. She laughed potentially embarrassing, but he didn't do it in public. Nevertheless, the elder in question told everyone that the boy had a mind like a steel cage. Nothing that got locked into it ever escaped. Darion grinned. What about Darkstone? 
his personality, she responded promptly, pessimistic, unchanging, and cold as a stone. And believe it or not, he chose it himself. It was an affectation when he was young. He liked that particular aloof image. Now he couldn't change it without more effort than he's willing to put in. Winter sky, rain dance, summer dance, all juvenile names. They haven't gotten use names yet, and their childhood names weren't so silly they were in a hurry to lose them. Hmm. Would anyone label me with a use name that I don't like, but am stuck with? He could think of a number of unpleasant possibilities. People can try, but if you refuse to respond to their name for you, it's considered good manners not to persist. You know the proverb, it isn't what you call me, it's what I answer to that counts. She nodded with understanding at his obvious relief. As long as you feel you are Darion and continue to respond to that name, no one will force you to accept another. At this point, he certainly couldn't foresee ever wanting to take a use name, not even if I were to do something really impressive. Do remember, if you do take a use name, that after you've had it for many years, it becomes a great effort to change it again, she cautioned. Usually something very dramatic has to happen before the change sticks in people's minds. I can't think of more than two or three people who've successfully gone to a new use name later in life. By then, they'd reached the entrance to Kevala, and they discussed when and where they would meet for his next lesson. Once inside the Vale, they dismounted and thanked the Daihili for their help. Darion escorted his teacher to her Ekele, one that was quite low to the ground by Taledra's standards. There he left her in the hands of her Hertasi helpers, and decided to see if Nightbird or Snowfire and Nightwind had eaten dinner yet, as he was in the mood for some company. I'll try Kel's Sunning Rock, he decided. That always seemed to be the place one or more of them ended up. Since he was in a very good mood, it came as an abrupt shock to him to walk straight into the middle of a fight between Snowfire and his beloved. He simply rounded a curve in the path, walked out into the open near the group of boulders that several griffins like to use for sunbathing, and there they were. Uh-oh. And no one is going to dictate whom I talk to, Nightwind said, clearly and precisely, just as Darion stopped in his tracks. Her eyes, dark with anger, were the color of a thundercloud and looked just about ready to produce lightning. Her hands were clenched, her knuckles white, and her posture as stiff as an iron rod. For his part, Snowfire was actually white with rage. His eyes had gone to a pale gray, and his jaw was set so hard that Darion expected to hear his teeth splintering at any moment. It was even more of a shock to Darion, since they were arguing in a place so very public. They'd argued before, even in his presence, but never where anyone could just walk into the middle of the spat— they were both using those sharp-edged, oh-so-civilized tones that meant they were really, really angry. They were both so caught up in their fight that neither of them paid the least attention to what was going on around them. He could have been a leaf for all the attention they paid to him. Kel, wise young griffin that he was, must have fled the moment the fight began. Darion was taken so much by surprise that he froze where he was, and it looked as though he wasn't the only one who'd been caught off guard and trapped by the altercation. Nightbird stood with her back to the trunk of a tree, looking very much as if she were bound there, and not much caring for it, on the other side of the line of battle from Darion. Look, I told you what he said, and to my face— Snowfire said between clenched teeth, his face set, his eyes blazing with white fire. He's lucky I didn't call him out in front of the elders for it. That's reason enough for you to avoid him. 
No, it isn't. And who are you to choose my friends for me? Nightwind shot back, matching him glare for glare. I am not going to give up friends I've had all my life just because you can't get along with them. He was my scouting partner all the way from White Griffin, and I'm not going to act as if he's come down with spots just because you got your precious masculine pride a little bruised. You don't own me, and the last time I looked, the Taledras didn't keep slaves. That was more than enough for Darion. He managed to catch Nightbird's eye and made a little motion with his head in the direction of the path. She nodded violently and edged around her sister until she got clear of the pair, then made a dash for safety. He grabbed her hand as she reached him, and they both beat a quick retreat up the path. What was all that about? he asked, as soon as they were out of earshot and felt as if they could slow down to a walk. And how did you get caught in the middle? Lessons with my sister, with Kel serving as the willing client, she said, a little out of breath. Snowfire came charging into the middle of it without so much as an excuse me and began ranting about a friend of hers. She paused, then said carefully, And if you don't mind, I'd rather not name names. He waved a hand at her. Don't worry, I'd rather not know. Well, the fellow in question is pretty well known among the Kaledain for saying stupid things without thinking and regretting it later, she replied. I guess that's probably what he did this time. That, and I think there's some jealousy there too, since he used to be Nightwind's partner, like she said, and the fact that she'd chosen to take someone else as her mate came as a nasty surprise. Nightbird looked very, very worried, though she didn't say anything more, and Darion had a fair idea why. She hadn't seen her sister for four years, and probably thought this represented a truly serious rift between Nightwind and her mate. So he's been brooding about it, and maybe today he was out of sorts, and he said something rude to Snowfire. Darion nodded. And I bet Snowfire was out of sorts, too, so Snowfire was in no mood to be forgiving. He sighed, then smiled reassuringly at her. Don't let this worry you. I've seen them fight before, you know. They don't do it often. It's always when both of them are on edge or feeling sensitive about something, and they always make it up afterward. Truly, couples do this sort of thing. Nightwind says it's because you can't live life so much a part of each other without eventually doing or saying something that's too irritating to ignore. Really? Nightbird lost some of that anxious look. Truly, he told her firmly. I've been caught in the middle of explosions just like that one. They'll make it up, especially if you can get whoever it was to come apologize, to both of them, if you can manage it. Me? she squeaked. Why me? Because you carefully didn't tell me his name. Darion was amused to see the expression on her face when she realized she was caught in a trap of her own making. Besides, I'm not a Kaledain, and I am Snowfire's little brother. I'm expected to be on his side. You, on the other hand, can go tell this fellow that he's a blithering idiot and deserves to have Kel drop him into the lake from treetop height and get away with it. He put a little coaxing into his voice. Look, you all but admitted that the fellow deserves it, and you are awfully good at dressing fools down in a way that rubs their noses in it. You're also awfully good at making them admit that they were idiots. I am, aren't I? I wonder if that's an undiscovered power, the gift of insult. She looked thoughtful for a moment, then smirked. You're right this time. I'm the logical choice. And what's more, I can make him feel so guilty about causing a fight at the same time I'm dressing him down that he'll be begging me to help him make an apology. She grinned suddenly. I have every right to be the one to make him feel guilty, too, since I'm the one who got caught in the middle. You know, sister always says I know how to work people around so well 
I ought to become a Kestra Chern instead of a Trondierin. I just tell her that it would be no fun if I had to do it professionally. There you go, he encouraged her. Tell you what, I'll arrange some dinner for both of us. You go give him what he's got coming, and then come meet me at the far end of the lake and tell me what happened. I promise to heap admiration upon you. It's a bargain. She strode off, determination making her spine stiff, energy giving spring to her step without looking back, probably because she was already rehearsing in her mind exactly what she was going to say. He chuckled a little and went in search of food that would put her in a very good mood. She liked finger foods, because what she liked was variety without getting filled up, so he hunted in a couple of the places where Herr Tassi put out dishes for those who preferred to graze for dinner. When one of the Herr Tassi learned what he was doing, things became a little easier, and he waited at the appointed spot with a special basket with a warm stone in the bottom of it to keep the steamed dumplings, sausages, and spiced fish cakes hot, and a second basket with a chilled stone for the sliced vegetables, dipping sauce, and special rolls Nightbird particularly liked, made of boiled grain, thinly sliced fish, vegetables, and spices all rolled in seeds." Sweet spring water in a glass bottle chilled in the same basket, and hot tea in a pottery jug stayed warm in the first basket. And when Nightbird arrived, looking just a little smug, he rewarded her efforts by opening both baskets, handing her a huge leaf to use as a plate, and giving her her first choice. Wonderful aromas rose from the first basket, and the contents of the second had been so artfully arranged by the Herr Tassi that she actually paused to admire the creation. She went straight for the chilled grain rolls, which was what he had thought might happen. That was perfectly all right with him, for he had no idea how anyone could eat the things. He helped himself to vegetables and steamed dumplings, and did not press her for details until after she'd had her first roll. Well, he asked archly, "'He should be groveling in front of both of them now,' she said with supreme satisfaction. "'And since they were already at the kiss-and-apologize stage when I left him with them, "'it should be even more gratifying for Snowfire. "'My sister will probably be exasperated with him, but she'll forgive him, so all will be well.' "'I told you they'd get over it pretty quickly,' he reminded her. Havens, with any luck, Snowfire and this mysterious fellow will actually become friends out of this. She nodded because her mouth was full, swallowed, and said, That's what I'm hoping, though it may actually take both of them trying to pound each other to powder before that happens. Why do some men have to be such idiots? Asked herself, he suggested. Seems to me there's a lot of King Stag stuff going on there. She snorted and tried a dumpling for variety. Well, I hope I never get caught in the middle of one of their fights again. It was so civilized, but so angry. It gave me chills. How can anyone fight like that? I don't know. I think it must be something they've worked out. It's pretty astonishing to watch, actually. Not pleasant, but astonishing. I've never seen anyone argue that way before. Where do they get this self-control? she asked, her brow wrinkling. What have you seen them do? It's what they don't do. They don't call names or make personal accusations. They get what's making them angry out first thing, and you'd swear that they're a short step away from killing each other. But then they get into why it made them angry. They actually take turns and try not to interrupt, and then, and I think this must be the important part, go into exactly how bad this made them feel. And at that point, the fire just goes out of the fight. They get things sorted out, then apologize, get things more sorted out. Then things are actually better than they were before the fight, I think, because they've made another compromise with each other. Nightbird's eyes widened at that. 
My, I think maybe I'd better not get joined to anyone after all. I don't think I could manage that. It sounds like an awful lot of work to go through just to stay with someone. He licked his fingers clean of juice from a dumpling. Maybe they couldn't either at first. I'm sure they had fights before the one I got caught in. I guess if you're going to get mad about something, it's better to get it out than let it sit inside and steam. He laughed wryly. I tend to steam, and it got me in a lot of trouble because things would build up and then let go without warning and I would really get it. She bit her lower lip. Aha, she agreed. That's my problem, too. Maybe we'd better make a vow just to stay friends. I have the feeling that we could really do damage to each other. If we started getting really intimate, then got angry with each other over something important. Oh, hellfires, but she's right. If we started getting very, very close, that's exactly what would happen. Don't make vows about the future, he warned, but you're right, and we could make a pledge that we'll try to just stay friends for that reason. Bargain? Bargain, she replied solemnly. Besides, we're practically related, and that feels too much like incest. Want to head over to Summer Dance's Ekele and see what she's doing? Maybe we can get a game group together. Or maybe you can get Firefrost to tell us some juicy old gossip. Good idea, he agreed. And in a short time they had polished off the last crumb and packed up the baskets to take back to the Herr Tassi at Summer Dance's Ekele. When he returned to his rooms later that evening, it was with some surprise that he found Snowfire waiting there for him, sitting on Darion's bed and sharpening one of his knives. Snowfire rose as soon as Darion entered and stopped short at seeing him there. I hope you'll forgive my invading your rooms, but I wanted to apologize for making things unpleasant for you this afternoon. Snowfire began. Accept it, Darion said instantly. It sounded as if you had plenty of provocation, but... He stopped, not sure he had the right to make the observation that had just occurred to him. But, Snowfire asked, Darion sat down, feeling awkward. Is it just me, or are people getting into a lot more quarrels here than we did out in Valdemar? Hmm... Yes and no. Snowfire rubbed the side of his nose. The thing is, the team we had put together, the team you joined, was made up of people who all knew each other well, well enough to make a lot of effort at getting along, but purposefully not so close that personal problems could arise. And we had a great deal to do, so we were often too busy to pick quarrels. Here, he gestured, palms up, here there are a great many more people, and when there are that many people, not all of them get along, not all of them have the same opinions on important matters, and, for that matter, not all of them agree about what an important matter is. So there are conflicts which are going to cause factions and quarreling. Now he smiled, and, to my mind, the most important factor, we all have a fair amount of free time. That's time we can use to brood about wrongs, to decide we've been insulted, and to pick quarrels for no particular reason. I'm no less prone to that than anyone else. Darion had to laugh at that. I guess that's something all peoples have in common, then, he agreed. When there isn't a crisis going on, there are going to be some people who want to make one. When things aren't dramatic enough, they feel impelled to create drama. And the more stress you're under, the fewer stresses you notice. We're no different from the people of your village in that way, little brother, Snowfire admitted. At least, not that much different. At any rate, I am sorry you walked in on our argument, and so is Nightwind. We both owe you and Nightbird apologies, and thanks for your constructive plotting. 
I'm glad you're picking up the Hertasi habit of benevolent conspiracy, so again I apologize, and thank you for deciding to stay involved. I'll accept both, only if you promise to try to remember that whoever it was is an insensitive moron, or at least he is according to Nightbird, and try to keep your temper next time. Darion tried to look stern and very adult, but had a hard time keeping a straight face over this blatant role reversal. Snowfire saw the joke and managed to act meek. I will, he whispered, bowing his head. Then he lost control and started laughing. Darion joined him. I will make that promise, but I have an ulterior motive, Snowfire admitted. Nightwind swears that if he does something like that again, and I'll just report it to her calmly, she'll give him the tongue-lashing of a lifetime, and I'll get to watch. Darion made his eyes widen. Ooh, I am impressed. Promise to tell me all about it if she does, or better yet, get her to invite me too. Now who has too much spare time? Snowfire asked, slapping him on the back as he stood up. Maybe I ought to ask Starfall to find you a fifth teacher. Darion tried to think of a good retort, but his mind went blank, and Snowfire took the opportunity to bid him good night and walk out the door. The next morning, Darion steeled himself for his usual lesson with Darkstone, but when he arrived at the shielded area where he usually met his teacher, Darkstone was nowhere to be seen. Instead, Starfall, Snowfire, and Firefrost were all waiting for him there. What is it? he asked, searching their faces and finding worrisome traces of concern there. Firefrost seemed to be spokesperson by mutual consent. How upset would you be to have to leave the Vale? she asked. You've made some friends here, perhaps close ones. Not so close that I'd have a broken heart over leaving, he replied, wondering what was going on. Have I offended anyone? Darkstone, maybe? Am I being asked to leave? If that was the case, a chill gripped him and his stomach clenched. No, absolutely not, nothing like that, Firefrost actually laughed, destroying his fear before it got started. Then she sobered and gestured to Snowfire. I think you'd best explain what is going on. We've had griffins on long patrols to the north since that clash with the barbarians, Snowfire explained. We, by that I mean Kevala, assumed that if one group has found a way through the mountains, others might well too. That's what seems to have happened. There's a barbarian group coming slowly south, very slowly, not much like an army, though. They have women and children and large wagons. They've even got some herd beasts as well. Firefrost chuckled. I wish you'd had a chance to hear the griffins go on about those herd beasts, the greedy things. Apparently these creatures are to ordinary deer what war horses are to ponies, and there isn't a one of the scouts but wants a chance to sink his beak into one. The griffins are more certain that these people are not dangerous than I am, or the other elders for that matter, Starfall amended with a worried frown. Yes, they might settle down. Yes, they might never reach either Valdemar or Kevala lands. Nevertheless, they are heavily armed, and they are taking the same general route as that first lot. So the elders of Kevala want your veil in place, fortified and manned, as soon as possible. In fact, we have griffins flying Hertasi in to get buildings up for us before we even get there, Snowfire interjected. Huh, this was moving awfully fast for him. Well, now I'm glad I gave Snowfire that map of ideas for the veil. You could do this without me, he offered tentatively. We could, we'd rather not, 
You are Valdemarin, and you have a perfect right to establish a holding in unclaimed Valdemarin lands, but we don't, Firefrost said briskly. If we're challenged, you are our answer. You're also known to the village and to the local lord, Snowfire pointed out. You're fluent in both our tongues. We are going to alter our plans and have an armed force living in this vale. You can at least help Starfall explain why we're bringing in fighters without either causing a panic or arousing suspicion of our motives. You're not bad with your tongue, boy, added Firefrost wryly. I've heard you, and you've got the benefit of an honest Valdemarin face. Darion laughed a little at that. Well, I suppose that's some sort of qualification. You're also a good fighter, if it comes to that, and a scout and trapper, Starfall said soberly. If we assume that these barbarians are coming south... On the whole, we would rather find that it's possible to negotiate with them. Your local lord may have other ideas. He may want to drive them back. In either case, we can't do anything without having a strong base to work from. Darion nodded, now just as sober as his teacher. I'd be a poor student if I hadn't learned that by now. Yes, I want to go now. The sooner the better. It sounds as if we need all the time we can get. I'd be really disappointed if you didn't take me, danger and all. But I'm going to go, hoping that this turns out to be a false alarm. Firefrost ruffled his hair in the way only a very elderly woman can get away with. I thank this star-eyed that you have the good sense to know this isn't an adventure. Darion licked his lips as memories of four years ago flashed through his mind. Experience, Elder, he said honestly, not necessarily good sense. Experience will do, and don't misjudge your very real good sense, Starfall corrected. He looked satisfied and a bit more relaxed than he had been. Snowfire, Firefrost, and I will put together the settlers for the new Vale. I'd like you to sit down and see if you can come up with anything you think we would want from a Valdemarin point of view. As you said, the sooner we're in place, the better. If we can, we'll be leaving with a pack train within a few days, and your new teacher will just have to catch up with us." They sent Darion off to go make his list, and it wasn't until he was sitting down with pen and paper that he realized he still didn't know the name of the new teacher, who now would have to catch up. Seven. An entire week went by before anyone in her family even noticed that Keisha wasn't sleeping in her room at all anymore, a week during which she enjoyed the best stretch of sound sleep she had ever experienced in her life. There weren't even any midnight emergencies to disturb her, and gradually people who came for treatment figured out that she had made the move a permanent one. In fact, she began to wonder if everyone in the village knew except her family. Predictably enough, it was her youngest brother, Trey, who first poked his nose into the vacant room and discovered that not only had the bed not been slept in, but that Keisha's things were all gone. Trey had been the one who had to be threatened with a near-death experience to keep him out of his sister's room. He had the curse of insatiable curiosity, combined with incredible mischief and the apparent desire to make the lives of his sisters difficult. Such a combination doomed him to a never-ending round of conflict within the family, conflicts from which he always emerged beaten but uncowed. Keisha suspected he would have played similar tricks on his brothers, except that they'd have boxed his ears for his efforts. At least, when he teased his sisters, he could count on the fact that his worst punishment would come from his mother or father, and probably would only involve physical labor in the form of punitive chores. 
This was normal behavior for a boy between the age when he was no longer willing to play with girls and the time when he discovered that girls were fascinating and desirable creatures. Keisha knew that, though it didn't stop her from chasing him out with a brandished broom more than once. Shandy had been known to mutter from time to time that if she had her way, Trey wouldn't live to grow out of his pranks. Somehow, though, Trey did survive, and when he invaded his sister's domain, he was careful not to let them find out about it. At this point in his life, Trey was far more interested in the girls his sisters could get to dance or spend time with him, and he had mostly grown out of his bad habits. But some things, like curiosity, are not the sort of traits that a boy grows out of. Neither is opportunism. Instead of going to his parents with his fascinating discovery, Trey came straight to Keisha. He walked right in through the open door of her cottage with a hint of a swagger. Fortunately for him, Keisha had no patience at the time, or he'd have gone right out again on his ear just on the basis of his smug expression. I know something, his face said, as plainly as if he'd spoken it, and I bet it's something I can get advantage out of. As it was, she was amused rather than annoyed. He thought she wouldn't want Mum and Da told, and he had no notion that she didn't give a pin whether he told or not. Still, as first to discover the vacancy, he would benefit, and that would probably satisfy him. He had taken particular pains with his appearance. His light brown hair was slicked back with water, his shirt neatly tucked into his trues, his face so clean that it was shiny. Evidently, he intended to impress her, which meant that he had actually thought things through for a change. So Trey is the first to notice. That's not bad, and he's been planning to see if I want to buy his silence. You know, if he's actually started to think before he acts, he may actually survive to adulthood. Say, Keisha, all your things are gone from your room, he said without preamble. I know," she replied calmly, continuing to roll strips of laundered and bleached cloth into bandages. The task she'd been doing when he barged in. I've moved in here. I'm tired of waking Da or Mum up when I get called out in the middle of the night, and I'm very tired of all the noise. You barbarians are bad when you clomp around in the morning, but the worst is the snoring. One of these nights, the house is going to vibrate apart, and the roof will fall down on you all. Trey ignored the insult, concentrating on the only important piece of information she had granted him: that the move really was a move, permanent, and not just for the summer. Does that mean you aren't coming back? Not only that, she confirmed, but I've packed everything up that I didn't take with me and gotten it out of the way up in the attic. I take it that you want to take possession of the room. Be my guest. I don't need it, and neither does Shandy. When Shandy comes back for visits, she can sleep over here. I've space enough. He grinned. That's what I was hoping you'd say. You're sure now? Very sure. She kept her expression as placid as a grazing sheep. It's about time I set up on my own anyway. People will give me more respect if I have my own household, and I can have the room. Absolutely. He didn't jump for joy, but he might just as well have, given the expression on his face. Thanks, Keisha. You're a goodin. You're welcome. She responded. But he hadn't waited to hear her. He'd pelted out of the cottage and up the path as fast as his feet would carry him, with the obvious intention of having himself in full possession of the precious cubbyhole before any of his brothers knew it was vacant. Possession being nine tenths of the law, it would be very difficult for them to evict him. And if he worked fast enough, he could even get one of the two beds disassembled and out before anyone came home, thus giving himself a room without anyone sharing it. The longer he remained in undisputed possession of the room, the less likely it would be that he could be ousted from it. 
so it was also in his best interest to keep any of his brothers from finding out that Keisha wasn't going to use it any more. Eventually, of course, they'd notice the change in occupants, probably within two or three days. But in the meantime, Keisha's absence would not be mentioned by Trey. By that time, both of them would be too well entrenched in their respective places to move. That gave her another three days of peace and quiet before Sidoni appeared at the door, time that she used to her advantage. Keisha had already made certain that her reason for setting up in the cottage had been firmly planted in the minds of every gossip in Erald's Grove. She'd made it clear how much more convenient this arrangement was for everyone, and she had the cottage so clean that not even the most fanatical housekeeper could have found fault with it. Sidoni walked straight in, just as Trey had, in the early morning just after Keisha had cleaned up after breakfast. This time Keisha sat in her favorite chair with both hands full of a sock, a wooden darning egg, a blunt needle, and wool yarn. She was in the middle of mending, which gave her an excuse to stay where she was as her mother strolled around the cottage, not speaking at all, but examining the place minutely, as if she had never seen it before. Sidoni's expression was closed, arms crossed over her chest, but Keisha knew that her mother could not hold in her feelings for long. Well, she said finally, you've certainly made yourself at home here. But her daughter had gotten a week's grace in which to decide exactly how she was going to handle the inevitable confrontation, and even though her stomach nodded and her head began to throb with tension, she kept her face calm and her manner casual. I started thinking after Shandi left, thinking that the house could do with a few less people in it. Bright havens, Mum. The boys would crowd Kelm's Keep, much less our place. Then I thought of other things. There was no need to keep disturbing you and Da with my night calls, since I have this place, she explained, keeping her voice warm and slightly amused. I haven't been much help around the house in the last six months, what with all the patients I've had, and with Shandy gone, it seemed as if it would be easier on you if I were to take care of myself. Now that the boys are doing their share of the work around the house, you really don't need my help at all anymore. This arrangement should be more convenient for everyone. Convenient? Sidoni's voice got a bit shrill, and her control over her expression slipped. Strangely enough, she looked a little frightened, as well as upset. Convenient for what? You aren't old enough to be living by yourself, and right at the edge of the village, too, out where who knows what could happen to you. What will everyone think? Here you are, all alone, no one to chaperone you. People are going to talk. They're going to say we drove you out, or that you ran away, that we're wretched parents to let you be on your own in the first place. Keisha laughed, startling her mother into silence. The laughter was strained, but Sidoni was too full of her own emotions to notice. Talk? Good gracious, Mum. What are they going to talk about? No one is going to think that you are bad parents. And if there had been a fight, you know that the neighbors would have overheard it. They didn't, so obviously there wasn't one. You can't be living alone, Sidoni insisted. There's no one to protect you here. Keisha shook her head and wished that she hadn't. I doubt that will ever be a problem. No one ever comes here that isn't sick or hurt. No one would dare hurt me. The rest of the village would have his head on a plate. As for this cottage being on the edge of the village, well, that hardly qualifies as isolation. If I even whispered for help, the neighbors would hear me. Maybe you don't think that living out here alone is going to cause people to gossip, Sidoni said darkly. But, Mum, there are no buts about it, Keisha interrupted, wanting to get the unpleasant scene over with. 
Not when anyone in the village can come here at any time of day or night, knock on the door, walk straight in, and see that I'm quite alone. You forget what I am. People have every right to come here whenever they need help. I have less privacy here than I did at home. If I were carrying on an illicit love affair, moving here would be the worst thing I could do. Keisha! Sidoni cried, shocked. Well, it would, she insisted. If I'm not here, it's going to be noticed right away, and people are going to want to know where I am and look until they find me. There is no way that I could go off for a romp in the hayfields, Mum. Sure as I did, someone would get sick or hurt, and the whole secret would be all over the village. And I can't have a young man here without someone eventually walking in on it. So there you are. Not only am I chaperoned, I have the entire village as my chaperone. She shrugged. Besides, as you well know, I haven't any suitors. I doubt that there's a boy in the entire village who thinks of me as a girl. I'm the healer, and for them, I'm about as likely a source of romance as a tree stump. Maybe, but you still aren't old enough to be on your own like this, Sidoni replied stubbornly. I'm old enough to be married, with a family, and you've said as much yourself, Keisha countered, as her stomach soured and her neck muscles nodded. So I'm old enough. I have all the proper domestic skills, and I can take care of myself quite neatly. Well, look around you. If you see anything amiss, I'd like to know. But what are people going to say about us, about your father and me? Sidoni's voice was no louder, but there was a definite edge to it. This, then, was probably the source of her anxiety. They're going to say that we drove you out, that we were such wretched parents that we fought, that— Again, Keisha interrupted— they're going to say what they've been saying for the past week, that I am a very considerate daughter to see that not only were night calls disturbing you, but that I was afraid that some folk hesitated to call me out because they didn't want to wake the rest of the household just to get me. I've made a point of telling everyone who noticed that I was actually living here that this was the reason why I moved. They'll say that only someone who was raised right would be polite enough to want to save her parents from such disturbance, and at the same time make herself more available to the village than she was before. She chuckled, shocking her mother out of incipient hysteria. And if you don't believe me, ask Mandy Lutter. She's all but taken credit for the idea herself. She's got half the village convinced that it was a chance remark from her that made me see it would be easier for people if I moved to the cottage. Oh, Sidoni said weakly, all of her arguments overcome. Keisha's own symptoms of stress began to ease, and she felt that she was winning the confrontation. Mother, love... I'm hardly living away from you when the house is all but next door, she pointed out, a little more gently. How big is the village, after all? If it will make you feel better, I'll make sure and come home for dinner as often as I can. If you need me to help, you've only to ask, and you know that. If I really wanted to leave you all, I'd let Gil arrange for me to go to Healer's Collegium. I'm here, aren't I? And haven't I said all along that I'm not going to the Collegium? I promise you, I haven't changed my mind. She would have said more, pressing home the point, but just then two young men came in, supporting a third whose arm bent at an entirely unnatural angle at the shoulder joint. Keisha dropped her mending and forgot everything she was about to say, forgot even her mother's presence, until it was all over and the dislocated shoulder was back in place again. By then, of course, Sidoni was gone. But she had simply slipped out, so Keisha had won, or at least her mother had gone off to think about what she had said. Sidoni was perfectly capable of thinking clearly when her emotions didn't get in the way. So when she's thinking dispassionately about what I told her, I will win, Keisha sighed, the last of her tension ebbing. It hadn't been nearly as bad as she'd thought it would be. 
A dislocated shoulder didn't create nearly the mess of the average wound, and there was very little to clean up after the young man had gone. Keisha put the room to rights again, returned to her chair, and picked up her mending, but her mind was still on her mother. It would probably be a good thing if I showed up at supper, or before, actually, with some fresh herbs or salad greens. That way I'll just show that I meant what I said, that I'm not actually leaving the family. I've just put a little distance between us. She finished the mending, took care of several children with insect stings and some ugly thorn scratches, then spent the afternoon dosing some horses for worms. As supper time neared, she finished that task, returned home, and went into her garden to gather a peace offering. She entered the kitchen with her basket of clean salad makings, expecting to find her mother there. But Sidoni wasn't at the house. She'd gone out to the farm, according to Trey, who was in charge of the evening dinner. He welcomed Keisha, her offerings, and her help with pleasure— and the two of them put together a good, warm-weather meal of soup, bread, and salad in short order. Sidoni came back arm in arm with her husband, sun-browned and smiling under the rim of her work hat, and greeted Keisha with calm pleasure. That told Keisha something important, that her mother had checked with Mandy Lutter, that most notorious of village gossips, and what she had heard had pleased and reassured her. Mandy was not likely to withhold anything juicy about anyone, not even to the subject's mother. So everyone is saying what a good girl I am to be thinking of my family and of the village's welfare, she thought with conscious irony. Mandy and the rest are all seeing how convenient the arrangement is for them, no doubt. Well, it is convenient for them, and I don't mind if I get a few more midnight calls than I would if I was still living here. They can say whatever they like about me. As long as it makes Mum and Da feel better about this situation, that's all that matters to me. She sat down with the rest to dinner, Sidoni having greeted her bonus of salad with a smile of thanks, and discovered that as of this afternoon there was another topic entirely to interest everyone in the village. She had taken second place to a much more entertaining subject. I saw Mandy Lutter today while I was on my way out to the farm. For once, there was a good reason to get Mandy's mouth going, Sidoni said, once the soup had been ladled out and everyone had started on the meal. I won't tease you and make you guess what her news was, though. It's too exciting for that. Young Darion Firkin is coming back at long last. He's going to come back, just as he promised Lord Brion, and there's going to be a mage here again. Can you believe it? For a moment, Keisha drew an absolute blank as to who Darion Firkin was, but only for a moment. She blinked in surprise. The young boy who had been Wizard Justin's apprentice had been gone for at least four years, and she honestly hadn't expected him ever to return, no matter what he'd promised. Why should he? He'd been adopted by Hawk Brothers. He'd gone out to see the world. What could possibly tempt him to come back here except that old promise? Back where? Here? Is he going to set up in Erold's Grove? And for one panicked, admittedly selfish instant, she thought, Am I going to have to give the cottage back? Oh, Havens, no. That can't be the reason Mum is so pleased. No, no, not here, not the village, Sidoni corrected, waving a chunk of bread vaguely at the window. He's going to have a place outside the village. He's going to have a lot of those Hawk brothers there, and of course they wouldn't feel comfortable living right in the village. But he will be within easy fetching distance of Erold's Grove. If we need his skills, we'll be able to get him. Thank goodness my refuge is still mine, was Keisha's relieved thought. 
Most people wouldn't feel comfortable with those bloody great birds about staring at their hens. Ivor pointed out with a laugh. So it's just as well he isn't planning on moving back into Erald's Grove. Don't forget, he's got one of those huge birds himself. So even if his friends didn't want to stay here, if he did, that bird would be here too. Poor hens and ducks would likely never lay again for sheer nerves. Where? Outside the village, one of the boys wanted to know. How far from here? They glanced at each other, and Keisha thought she knew the notions dancing in their heads. Hawk brothers. There were all sorts of things the Hawk brothers knew or could do, and anyone who got friendly with them stood a good chance of picking up some interesting information and skills. If this place they were settling was close by, a fellow had a chance of slipping over there now and again without being missed from his work. Sidoni shrugged. Mandy had no idea. Just somewhere outside the village, but on this side of the river, far enough away that it won't bother us, near enough that he'll be able to work magic for us when we need it. Her eyes widened, and she smiled broadly. Think of that. We'll have a real mage again. The Hawk brothers will be mages too, of course, but they'll have their own concerns to deal with. Darion will be our mage. A weather watcher, Ivor said in satisfaction. Damn! It'll be good to know when there's a monster storm on the way. Be even better if he's gotten to be a weather worker. We won't have to fret about a lot of things, I reckon. Sidoni sighed happily. I'll feel safer. That's for certain sure. Oh, and Mandy says he's going to have at least one griffin with him to come live at this place he's building. Think of that. A griffin? Keisha felt her own eyes widening. For as long as she could remember, she had wanted to see a real griffin, and now it appeared she was not only going to see one; she'd probably get to see one on a weekly basis. If this griffin was going to patrol for danger from the sky, his flights would have to take him over the village at least that often. Those were all the facts that Sidoni had gotten. The rest was all speculation, and Keisha could do that on her own. While the others chattered, she ate the rest of her meal without tasting it, and after helping with the dishes, went out looking for more solid information. She didn't have to go far; she simply followed her ears. A gaggle of folk had gathered in the village square just in front of the inn, and the murmur of their voices drew her to the gathering. The lantern over the inn door was lit, and underneath it, on the wall where anyone could read it, was an announcement with Lord Brion's seal at the top. So this has come from Kelmskeep. That makes it official. How wonderful! Whatever Lord Brion has sent over will be solid truth and no guessing. Keisha couldn't get anywhere near the posted message herself, but that hardly mattered, since the priest, Father Benjen, was reading it out loud for the benefit of those whose reading skill was limited to the ability to keep an inventory. He'd evidently gone through it at least once already, for some of those who had gathered here were going off to their own houses while newcomers pressed closer. Keisha had arrived just in time to hear it all from the beginning. This is all under Lord Brion's seal. See, there it is at the top, and it came over by messenger just this afternoon. He was saying as Keisha got within earshot. His voice was a little hoarse now from all the repeating. What it says, with all the fancy language paired off, is that Mage Darion Firkin and some of the Hawk brothers from Clan Kevala are fulfilling the promise they made back when Darion left with them. They're coming to settle outside the village, about halfway between us and Kelm's Keep. They're planning to stay permanently, and there's going to be more mages than just young Darion living at this settlement. But they'll probably all be Hawk brothers, except him. 
There's going to be one griffin at first, maybe more later on. There's no date for when they'll be settling in, just that it'll happen by harvest. What they're doing is building a kind of Hawk Brother village. They call it a Vale, and it's going to be a place where people besides Hawk Brothers are welcome. They plan to keep an eye on all of us as part of their treaty with Valdemar, and the griffin is going to be here to give us warning of anything nasty coming from a distance. This is going to be what Lord Brion calls a formal presence inside Valdemar. What he means is that these people will be Hawk Brother envoys here, and that's going to give us a lot more attention from the Queen. Well... That'll be grand, the blacksmith called out. You think maybe they'll be giving us our guards back? There's nothing about that here, but then Lord Brion wouldn't know what they've decided in Haven, Father Benjen replied. At a guess, I'd say it's likelier than not. Attention from the crown is probably going to mean at least that much. Who knows? Maybe they'll give us our own regional herald in permanent residence. Maybe some mercenary guards because of the added trade. There were little murmurs of relief all through the crowd, and no need to guess why. Those who had been here for the barbarian invasion, which was universally called the Great War, for it had certainly seemed like a war to this isolated place, had never quite gotten over it. Folk coming in from the Pelagirs were always closely questioned for any signs that the barbarians might be coming back, as were traders and travelers out of the north. No one quite had the courage to question the Hawk Brothers, but it was generally assumed, after their initial intervention, they would certainly give warning to Erold's Grove, if warning were warranted. Still, having someone here to give that sort of warning sooner would allow everyone to sleep easier at night. Keisha walked back through the soft, warm dusk to her cottage, half listening to the crickets singing, and trying to think out all the possible things this could mean to Erold's Grove, and by extension, herself. One thing certain, she thought, as she settled next to the fire with the rest of her mending. People are going to suffer less from nervous complaints— between the griffin and the mages keeping watch for trouble, the folk of Erold's Grove would no longer have to be quite so vigilant. I bet I get a lot fewer requests for nerve tonics and sleeping possets. By her reckoning, they would almost certainly get those guards back. Mind, they might well be men that were one step short of retirement, but they would be guards all the same. If there was going to be a Hawk Brother embassy, for certainly that was what this Vale thing was, the Queen would want an armed presence in the trading village nearest it. And a lot more traders will start coming, I bet. If they're certain to contact Hawk Brothers every time they come to our market, they'll come more often and start requesting specific things of them in the way of trade goods. More traders would mean more prosperity. That, too, was a fine thing for the village as a whole. More prosperity means more people coming here to settle, though, and that means more injury and illness. Surely, surely someone would see that Erold's Grove needed a fully trained healer. I'd even share the cottage if I could just become the trainee instead of the primary healer. That could solve all of her problems at once, but only if someone in the healer's circle decided that Keisha wasn't capable of handling the increased work. But what if they think I am? Then things aren't going to change at all. She sternly told herself not to panic ahead of time. No getting upset. She wasn't going to think about it. No use in creating trouble where there wasn't any. She'd be like the silly girl in the story, crying over lost sheep she didn't have, bought with the money from hens she hadn't yet hatched, from eggs her two little half-grown chicks hadn't yet laid. When she finished the last of the mending, she went out into her garden and took a seat on the bench there, looking up at the stars. 
A warm breath of a breeze carried the scent of honeysuckle past her as crickets sang nearby and a nightingale in the forest declared his love for his mate. The moon was a slender nail paring of a crescent and Keisha shook her hair back, letting the breeze cool the nape of her neck. Her thoughts circled around to the returning prodigal. I wonder what Darion Firkin is like. Firkin isn't a name from around here. She'd have a general idea of what he looked like if she knew his family, but it seemed to her that she remembered he was an orphan. That's right. That's why he was apprenticed to the wizard in the first place. Whenever people talk about him, they talk about a boy. But he's at least my age by now, eighteen at the least. That's a young man, not a boy. He'd be old enough to do all the things people expected of him, she would think. So by now, he's a mage, and he's got a hawk brother bird. He'll have traveled more than everyone in the village combined. He'll certainly have seen more of Valdemar than anyone here, except maybe Lord Brion and his family and liege men. They hardly count, though. We never see them except at Midsummer and Harvest Fair. He should make quite an impression when he gets here, especially when people realize he isn't a young boy anymore. She smiled wryly. There was one thing that was as predictable as the sun rising. Every unattached young woman in Erald's Grove would be setting her cap for him. How could they not? He wasn't so homely as a boy that anyone made note of, so he could hardly have grown into an ugly young man, and he would not only have the cachet of being a new, unknown male, but an exotic and a traveler. The older folks might be thinking of him as a boy still, but the girls are going to add up years and figure he's of courting age. There's going to be a lot of sewing and embroidery going on for the next few months, she decided. I wish Shandi were here. She'd be right in the middle of it all and tell me all the tales. Personally, she was just anticipating finally seeing a griffin, maybe hearing it speak. It would bring a touch of excitement to the skies over the village if she could look up from time to time to see the enormous wings passing overhead, or see a momentary griffin shadow against the moon. That was all the magic that she needed in her world. The griffin was a certainty. She considered other possibilities that the Hawk Brothers might bring. So the other thing this means is that if Hawk Brothers are coming to settle, they'll be bringing more of their medicines and treatments. Would they bring a healer? Now that was worth getting excited about. The Hawk Brothers were mages. Everyone knew that. So any healer they brought with them would, must, have the secret to unlock those puzzling texts of hers. Steel mines from Kevala, their chief healer sent seeds through him to help me, so they already know that I'm here. Healers always work with other healers. That's part of the oath. So if they bring a healer with them, it's bound to be someone who knows all about using healer's gift, and it's bound to be someone who'll at least give me enough help to get me on my feet." This could be the solution to all of her problems, never mind Darion Firkin and even the Griffin. Now she could hardly wait to meet the Hawk Brothers and learn if they did have a healer among them. Whatever it takes, I'll find the way to get him to teach me. She laughed out loud in relief, as a burden she had carried so long she hardly noticed it any more, lifted from her shoulders. No more mysteries, no more making excuses to Gil. It would only be a few short moons, and she would be learning the last skill she needed to consider herself a real healer. With the lifting of the burden, after the initial feeling of giddy pleasure, came a sense of relaxation. A few moons? She could wait that long. And meanwhile, there were babies coming, childish illnesses to dose, broken bones to set, gashes to stitch. She would have her hands full enough to avoid fretting between then and now. 
She went to bed and slept the soundest sleep she'd had in years, waking with the birds, feeling as if she had been healed. That day, after a round of children who'd gotten belly aches from eating too many half-ripe berries, she went out into the garden for some fresh mint. As she stooped to pick the pungent leaves, a strange shadow crossing the ground in front of her made her glance up. It was a griffin. It couldn't be anything else. It wasn't alone, either. There were more of them, carrying baskets suspended between pairs of them. She couldn't make out what was in the baskets. They were too high, but there was no doubt of what they were. She stared at them until they vanished over the trees, tending vaguely upriver where the veil was alleged to be. She all but forgot the mint in her hands until they were gone, and she realized she had crushed it. Eight. The news that a new invasion of barbarians had been sighted changed everything, turning what had been leisurely planning into a spate of frenzied activity. Griffins carried basket loads of Hertasi to the new Vale to get it ready in advance, as the rest of those who had volunteered or been specifically requested to populate the place packed up their belongings and prepared to make the move to their new home. By the time everyone arrived, there would be quarters waiting for them, somewhat more primitive quarters than they were used to, to be sure, but living spaces that could be improved upon and enlarged until they met the standards of those accustomed to living in a long-established vale. After all, it wasn't even midsummer yet. There were three more moons of warm and sunny summer weather to go, and another couple of moons before things got uncomfortably cold. A veil full of Hertasi and humans working together would have fine living quarters put together long before then, and the only improvements after that would be cosmetic. Darion alone, of all of them, didn't have much to pack, so he was ready to go long before anyone else was. He tried to lend a hand to some of the others, but his help was always politely declined. That gave him time that he tried to fill as best he could, studying hard with Firefrost, working on further plans for his veil, and, for a while at least, spending as much time as he could spare from both those tasks with Summer Dance. He paid very close attention to his feelings about her and tried his best to decipher hers for him. He didn't want to leave without her if what tied them together was closer than mere friendship. Their dalliance on the night of the wedding had been an entirely new set of experiences for him, and like a child with a new tooth, he felt as if he had to probe his feelings constantly to see what they were. He might even have convinced himself that he and Summerdance were meant for each other as permanent partners, if it hadn't been for the fact that she didn't act any differently toward him than she did toward any other young man whose company she enjoyed. In fact, when it came to the company of young men, she was a great deal like the tiny blue butterflies that shared her use name of Summerdance, going from flower to flower, or boy to boy, without spending very long with any of them. So, after careful consideration, he came to the somewhat reluctant conclusion that if a romance between himself and Snowfire's cousin were ever to happen, it probably wouldn't occur until after she got a new use name. If then... He consoled himself with their friendship and her very clear enjoyment of his company. If he was not to be her great love, at least he was still a love. No sooner had he come to that conclusion than he found that he was just as glad that she didn't have any special feelings for him, because she kept introducing him to friends, who apparently wanted to give the Valdemar Hawk brother a memorable send-off. Life was very interesting during that time, and he simply enjoyed his newfound popularity, knowing that when his special teacher arrived, he would have little, if any, time for a personal life. 
For a time, it seemed as if the Hawk brothers were never going to get themselves organized enough to make the move. Then, suddenly, everything was organized, packed up, and ready to go. The announcement came late one afternoon, taking him by complete surprise. He had returned from a lesson with Firefrost, followed by dinner, and was about to change for a hot soak, followed by bed, when his room was invaded by a swarm of Hertasi. Before he knew what was happening, the Hertasi were carrying off his belongings and double-checking to make certain nothing would be left behind. Then they vanished, leaving him alone with the single set of clothes he pried out of their eager, stubby talons. He got his soak all right, but only because he had changed into one of the communal lounge robes. He didn't have any other clothing left but what he needed for the next day. He soaked until he thought he was relaxed enough to sleep, returned to his room, laid out the set of his old scout gear that the Hertasi had left him, and fell into his bed for his last night in Kevala as anything but a visitor. The next day he was awake before the Hertasi came to fetch him, too excited to sleep any more. He'd had dreams all night long about the new veil and the journey to get there and more ominous ones about his new teacher, who seemed to be a combination of Darkstone and everyone in Erold's Grove who'd ever disapproved of him. He took his time over breakfast. Once he realized that the sun wasn't in the sky yet, it might be a while before he enjoyed the kinds of food available in Kevala. Aishin was going to be in charge of the Herr Tassi there, though, so even if it wouldn't be possible to replicate the feast day delicacies of the wedding celebration, it would still be good food. Finally, a Herr Tassi came to tell him that everyone was gathering to leave, and he mounted Tercel's saddle for the first steps of the journey with the unsettled feeling that he wasn't ready for all this. What am I doing? I'm not a leader. How am I going to take charge of a new veil? Maybe I should change my mind. Maybe I ought to be staying here. But he shook off that momentary panic with self-derision. That was specious. He wasn't going to be in charge for many years to come, not until Starfall, Nightwind, and Snowfire, the new veil's elders, judged him ready to take his place with them. He had a lot to learn between then and now. They'd consult him, of course, especially on matters involving Erold's Grove, Lord Brion, and Valdemar, and they'd involve him in discussions, but he wouldn't be a leader for a long while. Eventually, I'll go back to Erold's Grove. I wonder how they're going to react to me. He wasn't a boy any more. In fact, if his memory served him correctly, he'd be a match for most of the men in the village. He was a better fighter. He'd been taught to fight in every style, from bare-handed to bow. And with the men who'd been trained to be the village militia all dead, there was probably no one left in the village who had been taught to fight. Not of the original villagers, at least. According to the Taledras who went there to trade, the village had grown considerably since he'd left. Nevertheless, he was a warrior, and that ought to give him a certain cachet and respect. You know, to a certain extent, I'm actually Lord Breon's equal, or his son Val's, anyway. Now that was certainly an intoxicating notion, but in the hierarchy of Valdemar, it was true. The new veil would qualify as a lord's holding, and he was the heir apparent to the leadership position. I hate to interrupt your introspection, Tercel said dryly in his mind, but just about everyone has left. I'd wait until you were done with your mental soliloquy, but then I'd have to gallop to catch up, and I don't believe you'd enjoy that. He came to himself with a start. Tercel was right. The last of the laden Daihili herd had lined up to pass through the entrance of the Vale, and it was time for the rear guard, himself and Tercel, to get on their way. Uh, thanks, he said with embarrassment, as Tercel took his place at the end of the line. 
I promise, I won't do any more wool-gathering. I should hope not, the Dihele stag replied with dignity. As he and Tercel passed through the vale, Kuari dropped off the branch on which he had chosen to perch and winged silently past them into the uncontrolled, mist-wreathed forest outside. At this time of the year, the first couple of candle marks before and after dawn brought floating streamers of mist up out of the ground to circle among the trunks until the heat of the day drove them off. There were no such mists inside the veil, of course, except on the rare occasions when the elders decided that mist would make a pleasant effect. It was cooler out here, too, understandably damper, and the first thing he noticed when he came out through the veil and took his place at the end of the group was the absence of flower scent. Flowers bloomed constantly in the veil, day and night, regardless of season, but not out here. It was too late for spring flowers, which were all that bloomed in a heavy forest. Spring was the only time that enough light reached the ground for blossoms, except in places where there were clearings. So the perfumes he had become accustomed to were replaced with the metallic tang of fog, the earthy taste of decaying leaves and needles, and the faint musk of the dihele. Tercel led a new herd, much bigger than the previous one, composed of his original core and most of the adolescent and young adult Daihili from the other herds of Kevala. This gave some much-needed population relief to the Kevala home herds and a much-needed outlet for the youngsters. It also greatly increased Tercel's status, both that his herd was three times the size it had been and that he was considered capable by the other king stags of controlling so large a herd. Darion had been suitably impressed when he'd been told this new herd established Tercel at the very top of herd hierarchy, a kind of Dihele great lord of state. Because of the size of this herd, and because griffins had been ferrying baggage and would continue to do so as long as there was baggage to ferry, there had been no need for anyone to have to leave anything behind. All in all, this would be a relatively easy resettlement, as orderly as any migration from an old veil to a new one. Except that we can't just step across a gate to get there, more's the pity. It would take a week, roughly, of dawn to dark riding to get there, and he had no doubt that Snowfire meant that quite literally. They would rise before the dawn and not make camp until after dusk. Still, it wasn't anything he hadn't done before, and he fell back into his habits of rear guard, habits that fit him as comfortably as a well-worn and supple hawking glove. "'We're about to be relieved of duty,' Tercel said suddenly on the last afternoon of the journey, as they passed beneath trees that had changed very little with the passing of a mere four or five years." The Dihele pricked his ears forward, and Darion turned to see a figure riding back along the line of baggage-laden Dihele coming toward them. A moment later, he recognized Nightwind and waved at her. She waved back, and when she got into conversational distance, told him, Kel and I are going to take rear guard. We're just about at the new vale, and Snowfire and Starfall thought you two might like to enter at the head of the line instead of the tail. Well, that's a courteous thought, Tercel said with approval. Thank you. I know I would prefer it. Me too, Darion agreed self-consciously. He sent a brief thought to Kuari, then relinquished his duty to Nightwind. By going into a hard canter, he and Tercel came up to the front of the line well in time to go through the titular entrance side by side with Starfall and Snowfire. He felt a swell of pride so powerful that he flushed as they gravely made space for Tercel to fit between them. 
There was no entrance as such, no veil, for there was as yet no real heartstone, only a kind of superior node anchored in a physical rock formation. But the Heratasi and the few Taledras who had preceded them had set up two rough pillars of stone on either side of the pass that led them into their valley to mark where the veil would one day be. And they had done some subtle defensive improvements as well, although you would have to know what you were looking for to find them. They had made the sides of the hills far steeper, making it very difficult for an armed force to get into the new vale by climbing the hillsides. There were well-camouflaged guard points on those hillsides, and anyone who tried to invade that way would shortly be full of arrows. But to look at them, there was nothing more unusual here than exceptionally steep rock formations, formations that had probably been this way since the beginning of the world. No swarm of Daihili and Hertasi met them this time. The Hertasi were probably working hard on the building. But Aishin, who had gone on ahead, did meet them, standing in the center of the path, actually bedecked in his formal costume, bowing ceremoniously to all three of them. The Hertasi of Kevaldamar Vale welcome you to your new home, friends and brothers, he said ceremoniously. May there always be as much pleasure here as you bring with you. Starfall smiled and bowed in return. Your welcome doubles our pleasure, my brother, he replied. It is good to be home. Starfall dismounted, which seemed to be the signal for everyone else to do the same. Allow me to guide you to your new Ekele, Aishen said, and without waiting for a reply, led the way up the path that looked increasingly unfamiliar with every step. It wasn't one of the paths in Kevala, but it also wasn't the path that Darion remembered. Someone had been hard at work on the plantings, someone like Steelmind, who could coax plants into amazing growth spurts in a very short period of time. Although by no means as lush as Kevala, there were the vine screens, plantings of exotics, and tree sculptures that Darion had come to think of as proper. The path twisted and turned, crossing over the little stream, he remembered, with rustic bridges and artistically placed stepping stones providing dry-footed crossings. From time to time, Aishin stopped and pointed out a dwelling of one sort or another, most of them proper tree-built ekele, though the trees never supported more than one, and access was by means of a rope ladder more often than a staircase. When he stopped, those who found the place attractive would pause long enough for a discussion of who was the most taken with the situation— the discussions never lasted too long. One person, or two, if it was a couple, would remain, the Daihili with the appropriate baggage would remain, and everyone else would go on. Starfall quickly took possession of an Ekele built in the tree where his old camping place had been, and no one disputed him. Then Aishin stopped in front of what appeared to be a vine-covered mound. This was your original camping place, Snowfire, he said, and I wondered if either you and Nightwind or Darion would have a preference for it. Have you made an Ekele in the cliff where Nightwind and Kel originally camped? Snowfire asked. Aishen nodded. Actually, he said with evident pride, I designed that one, and it's built both on the cliff and in the cliff, rather like an ekele without a tree, with a balcony outside. But I thought I'd offer you this first. Snowfire laughed. You needn't have bothered. It sounds like a white griffin home, and I already know what Nightwind will want. How about you, Darion? Do you want this site? 
although he wondered a little just what was underneath that mound of leaves, which certainly seemed bigger than the primitive hut that he remembered, Darion knew one thing for certain. This place was on the ground, and there were going to be storms in this vale for some years yet. It would take a long time to power up the new heartstone to the equivalent of the Kevala stone. And until Kevaldemar, whose idea had that name been, was sealed against the weather and the seasons, he did not want to live in a tree that would sway in a storm. I'll take this, he said instantly, if no one else likes it better than I do. Snowfire laughed again, as did several others. Little brother, I doubt that anyone here but a Kairi or a Hertasi would care for a dwelling on the ground the way you do, Aishan said genially. The Daihili carrying Darion's baggage separated from the rest, and the group went on, leaving Darion in solitary possession of his new home. The first thing he did was to take the baggage off the patient Daihili so that they could go off to graze or rest. As they paced off with the click of carefully placed hooves, he turned his attention to the Ekele. It took him a moment to find the door, and it was a door now, a good, solid wooden door with a handle, not a mere screen of vines. When he opened it, he stared in open-mouthed disbelief at what lay behind it. This place could not be more unlike the hut that had once stood here. Beneath the vines were solid walls, as thick as his forearm was long at least. Outside they were the same color as the vines. Inside they had been whitewashed. The floor had been covered in flat paving stones, cunningly fitted together so that a sheet of paper could not fit between them, and sealed with grout. There was a stone fireplace in one wall, real windows with glass in them in the others. The windows were fairly well covered by the leaves and didn't let in much light, but there were skylights in the remarkably thick roof that took care of that deficiency. Like most Taledras dwellings, there wasn't a straight line to be seen, for all the walls and even the doors and window frames curved. Instead of furniture, there were window seats, low tables, thick rugs of fur and fleece, and cushions everywhere. A door in the same wall that held the fireplace led to a second room, but Darion waited to bring his baggage inside before he explored further. When he did, he discovered that the fireplace was shared with this room, which was a sleeping chamber, quite windowless and without a skylight, with a bed built into the wall and chests woven of willow branches for clothing. There was yet another door leading out of this room, and his curiosity took him onward. Much to his delight, it was a bathing chamber, as he had found in the guest houses in Kevala, with a pipe leading into a spacious tub, another into a wash basin, and a water flushing necessary that would be far more comfortable to use than a privy. One of the first things he had learned from Snowfire was how to use magic to heat his bath water, so even the cold water coming from the stream in midwinter would be no problem. Light came from another skylight, and someone in a fit of whimsy had built containers to hold plants all around the edge of the skylight and planted flowering vines in them. Now, as long as he could remember to water them, he'd have a touch of Kevala here all year long. The thick walls would keep this place warm in the winter and cool in the summer. The vines screening the skylight would keep out direct sun in the summer, but when they lost their leaves would allow warm sunlight to penetrate in the winter. There was no direct light in the bedroom, exactly as Darion preferred. If he had designed the place himself, it could not have suited him more, and all of this hidden under an innocuous mound of leaves. He unpacked his baggage quickly, stowing it away wherever things seemed best to fit. 
What little furniture there was matched the ekele perfectly, being formed of bent, polished branches with the bark removed or woven of willow withes. And as he put the last of his belongings away, the thought hit him with the suddenness of a lightning strike that this was his own home. He shared it with no one. It wasn't a guest house. This was his, entirely his to decorate as he chose, to clutter as he chose, or rather, as much as the Herr Tassi would let him, to change as he chose. My own place, bigger than the cottage he had shared with Justin, and far, far superior to that dark little hovel. Dear gods, I think I feel grown up. That was certainly the measure by which people judged in Erold's Grove. You weren't an adult until you had a house of your own, however tiny and poorly built. Until then, you were a child, and subject to the orders and whims of the adults in whose house you lived. He sat down in one of the window seats and took a deep breath, savoring the moment. Then he went out to find Snowfire and see this peculiar cliff house of his. He knew where Nightwind and Kel had set up housekeeping, of course, so he headed for the lake at the end of the valley and the cliffs overlooking it. Kel was already in residence, stretched out on a ledge near the top of the cliff in the sun, overseeing a line of Hertasi carrying baggage up a stair that had been carved out of the living rock. At the top of the stair was a balcony with a low stone railing. A dark recess behind it probably represented the door into the new dwelling. The ledge Kel had draped himself over had a similar dark recess behind it, and belatedly Darion realized that this must be his home as well. He followed the last Hertasi up the stair, and tried not to think about how far down it was as he climbed, nor how much he wished that there was a railing on the staircase. Though the railing about the balcony ledge was no more than knee-high, he was grateful for its presence. There was a door cut into the rock, and windows too. That was all he had a chance to see for the moment, as Kel greeted his arrival by leaping to his feet and bounding over to the balcony from his own ledge. Is this not a marvel? the griffin chortled. Aishan is a genius, except that it is a lake beneath us and not an ocean, and the rock is grey. This could be white griffin. I feel entirely at home. And so do I, Night Wind echoed, as she came out onto the balcony. She was smiling broadly and held out her hand to Darion. Even Snowfire is happy. Snowfire is more than happy, the Hawk Brother interrupted her. He stepped right up to the edge of the balcony and peered down. Not only is this as high up as any good scout Ekele, but I think I can dive into the lake from here. Don't you dare, cried Kel, Nightwind, and Darion all together. Why not? he asked, turning away from the ledge, wearing a grin that was the equal in mischief to his cousin's summer dances. You'll break your silly neck, that's why not, Nightwind said tartly. It's not deep enough, and the cliff slants out, not in. There is at least one thing you don't have to do to keep up with Starfall. Yet, added Aishan from the doorway, there's plenty of time to dig it deeper at this spot. Nightwind threw up her hands in exasperation as all three males, Darion, Kel, and Snowfire, now went to the edge to look down at the sparkling waters of the spring-fed lake with speculation. I don't think so, Darion finally said. You'd have to dive out too far. Nightwind is right. There's too much stuff you could hit on the way down. That, too, could be changed in time, Aishan said agreeably. But we do have many other tasks that will take precedence. 
Far too many tasks, Snowfire confirmed with a sigh. And by the time we have the resources, I'll probably be telling my offspring why they shouldn't dive off from here. Nightwind will never forgive me if I remove the obstacles in their path. You can count on it, his mate said darkly, a hint that a laugh would be out of place at this moment, so Darion choked it down. Instead, when everyone but Kel went back inside, he followed. Kel took up his place on his ledge again, stretching out in the sun with a huge sigh of contentment. Inside, the walls had been whitewashed, just as the walls of Darion's home had been, and for the same reason, to make the rooms brighter. The windows were larger than Darion had expected, but instead of glass, had that odd, transparent substance, tougher by far than glass, that served as windows in tree ekele. It occurred to Darion that his skylights must be made of the same substance, in case of a hailstorm. The furnishings were similar to his own, though there were more pieces of furniture and fewer piles of cushions. Someone had managed to carve a fireplace out of the rock, though Snowfire was perfectly capable of warming the whole home with magic if he had to. The bedroom is as dark as a pit, Snowfire said, as Darion glanced at a further doorway. Not that this is bad, mind you. I'll just have to get used to it. I do admire the bathing room, though. Aishan, and I do not want to think of the amount of work it took to get piped water up here. The water comes down from a cistern of rainwater until you exhaust it. Then the amount of work will come from your muscles on the pump, my friend, Aishan grinned. No free-flowing water without a full heartstone, you know. It's worth it, and by the time I'm too old to pump water, we'll either have a full heartstone, or I'll be able to delegate the task to the children. He laughed. I also appreciate the thick walls of solid stone between the master bedroom and the others. That is one advantage one does not have in an ekele being able to shut out the shrieks of sibling rivalry or playtime. Darion grinned. Well, it looked like Snowfire really was settling down, if he was making plans and statements that included future children. Why do you think the cliff houses at White Griffin are such desirable property? Nightwind responded. Aishan, is the rock at the back sound enough to continue to cut new rooms? Quite sound, Aishan replied. You'll be able to get a nursery and at least three bedrooms back there before you run into flawed material. Hmm, Nightwind's eyes lit up, and Snowfire looked positively gleeful. Darion blushed a little, decided that he'd seen enough, and went back outside. Come over and see my lair, Kel called from the ledge. There was a narrow walkway connecting the balcony to the ledge, about as wide as the stair had been, but Kel clearly preferred to leap from one to the other, showing off his agility. Well, a slip doesn't have the same consequences for a creature with wings. Darion practiced discretion and used the walk as Kel rose to his feet. Darion was a bit surprised to see that Kel's lair had a door and windows very like snowfires. For some reason, he had gotten the impression that a griffin would live in something very like a cave. When Kel opened the door to the eyrie, using a latch made for a griffin's talons, he was soon disabused of that notion. This place was only a single room. For now, I need only this room, Kel said. When I find the appropriate mate, I will enlarge my eyrie with a nursery as well. There was no furniture, only enormous cushions covered in furs, leathers, or extremely tough and colorful fabrics. 
There was also no fireplace, and it was quite clear that the place would be illuminated by mage lights, not lanterns. Why mage lights? Darion asked. I thought we were keeping magic use to a minimum. Griffin feathers are flammable, Kel pointed out. So I will get to make use of magic to heat and light my lair. Kairi, having no hands, will have their fires tended by Herr Tassi, but the risk to a griffin is too great to have an open flame about. This could be very cozy, Darion observed, trying out one of the cushions and finding it yielded just enough to make it a good seat. The view from here during a storm should be fantastic. I expect so, Kel agreed with contentment. It is so at White Griffin. I have enjoyed many shows of lightning from the balcony there. Darion resolved to get up here sometime when a storm was due. If there was one thing he loved, it was storm watching. Aishin entered at just that moment, having left the happy couple to arrange their own belongings in peace, and Darion lost no time in telling him what a wonderful job he had done in designing the cliff home and the eyrie. Aishin couldn't blush, but he enjoyed the praise, switching his stubby tail a little and stretching his mouth in a grin. Well, I do not design costumes, nor artwork, nor furnishings, he said modestly. My talent is only equal to partitioning space, as it were. Kel snorted. Partitioning space, indeed. Well, I have told you already that you are a genius, and I shall not bother with another attempt. He turned to Darion. You should see what this fellow calls partitioning space. He had no chance to show his talent in Kevala, but he is the chief designer here. Did you design my place too? Darion asked, seeing a similarity in the proportions of his home and Snowfire's. It's wonderful, perfect. I couldn't have anything better. How did you know what to do? I did design it, Aishan confirmed, and I admit it was with you in mind. I am glad you like it. I tried to remember what it was that you liked and disliked about various Ekele in Kevala. I'm just curious about one thing, Darion continued. How is it made? It's not rock, but... Aishan laughed. You may not believe it, but I will show you later. Willow withes and earth, little brother. Willow withes and earth. It is the easiest way to build that I know of. It holds in cool or heat, and is altogether an ideal way to make a shelter, so long as you seal the walls well. Earth, Darion did find it hard to believe, but wouldn't it just turn to mud in the first rain? Aishan shook his head. No, I promise you, we build that way in White Griffin and learned it from the Hylai, and it is much wetter in their kingdoms than here. We weave the walls, inner and outer, and support them with timber, then pack the space between with earth rammed hard. Then we make a mix of powdered lime and sand and other things into a thick paste and apply it upon inner and outer walls to make them waterproof. The roof is similar. The drawback is that we cannot alter a dwelling so made. We can only add to it. Windows, doors, and recesses must be built in from the beginning. Darion knew better than to doubt the Hertasi, but the idea of a house as sturdily made as his being constructed of such flimsy materials as willow withes and plain earth seemed fantastical to him. And yet... What could be more practical? 
you will get a chance to watch and help in such a construction, Aishan promised. There are many things that we must still build here, and most buildings on the ground will be made this way. I'm looking forward to it, he replied. Aishan laughed again. You may regret saying that when you are in charge of a ram, he cautioned. But now I must go see to food preparation. And I must go to hunt my food, Kel chimed in. Then I guess I'll go see if I can be useful to Starfall, Darion said, and he followed Aishin down the narrow stair while Kel took the more direct route out by leaping from his sunning ledge into the wind. Darion did find himself on the business end of an earth ram the very next day, for the first of the large buildings that everyone wanted put up was the one that would contain the seed of a new veil. The walls had to be reinforced with rock as well as timber for such a large building, and even with every free hand in Kevaldemar working, the walls rose with painful slowness. It was literally painful, in fact. Most everyone went to bed each night with an aching back, neck, and arms, for the earth between the inner and outer walls had to be pounded until it was nearly as hard as rock itself. Now Darion could readily believe that his house would last far past his own lifetime. But with so many people at work, the walls were actually finished in a mere week, enclosing quite a large space of land near the lake. Water was brought up from the lake and fed into a channel at the top of the building, to flow into a series of pools and waterfalls exactly like the hot pools at Kevala. It flowed out again through a channel at the base of the building, and from there to a purifying sand and charcoal pit— once the water began flowing, the Hawk brothers scoured the forest for fallen trees, seasoned but not rotten, and brought back huge beams and support pillars for the roof. Once these were in place, large squares of the skylight material were seated between the beams and sealed against leaks. Now the communal pools were ready for their living occupants. Taledras, with the gift of accelerating the growth of plants, including steel mind, went to work with the seeds and seedlings the griffins ferried over from Kevala. When they were done, although the growth was a bit sparse, the building contained a miniature veil, quite large enough to hold all of Kevaldemar's current inhabitants at once. The colorful little chattering messenger birds of the Kaledain flew freely in here, as did the hummingbirds that the Taledras used for the same purpose. A little magic would be used to heat the waters, a luxury, but one that everyone agreed was the sort of thing that made life much easier than it would have been otherwise. The waiting heartstone, now fully awakened, had been fed passively by the newly formed ley lines for the past four years, and Starfall was pleased with the amount of power that had managed to accumulate in that time. There was certainly enough to set up the soaking pools, magical sentries and protections, and basic shields. Darion helped with that as well, feeling rather proud of his ability to contribute to the magical well-being of his new veil. Next up were communal kitchens, buildings for the sick, for mass laundry, and facilities for those whose ekele, most of them, as it turned out, did not have bathing rooms like Darion's. Putting such facilities in tree houses was a great deal more difficult without magic. So until there was magic, those who preferred tree dwellings would have to do without. If they had not had Aishan's expertise, Darion suspected that neither he nor Snowfire and Nightwind would have had their own private bathing rooms either, but he kept his suspicions to himself. The Hertasi and Kairi already had their dens and lairs dug into the hillsides and lined with ceramic tiles for cleanliness and comfort, so nothing more needed to be done for them. 
but the Daihili needed a winter shelter, so that was the next building to go up, also made of rammed earth. They didn't mind an earthen floor, however, so their building was finished quickly. Then, with all of the immediate needs taken care of, it was time to make a call on the neighbors. The initial greeting committee wasn't to be a large one. It consisted of the three elders, Starfall, Snowfire, and Nightwind, of course. To that group were added Aishin, for the Hertasi, a handsome neuter called Hashi, his real name sounded like a sneeze, for the Kyrie, Tercel for the Daihili, and last of all, Darion. It was Darion who had pointed out that they would make a much more favorable impression on Lord Brion if they came to him, rather than the other way around, so instead of waiting for Brion to come calling, the first thing they did, once the initial settling in was over, was to put that in motion. A messenger went to Kelmskeep to ask if they might come to present their respects, he returned the same day with a message of welcome and an invitation to visit in three days. The reply was phrased formally enough to show that Brian took them seriously, but informally enough to show that he was ready to be friends. So their first impression was a favorable one. It's good that he said three days, Darion told the others with confidence. More than a week would mean that he didn't think we were important enough to postpone other business, and two days or less would mean he didn't think we were important enough to have business that we have to clear away. Then he laughed. Looks as if all that business about manners that got hammered into my head is going to turn out useful. I certainly never thought it would. Why not? Snowfire asked. Courtesy is always appreciated. Because it was all taught out of this musty old book meant for people like Lord Brion's heir, Val. Highborn people who have to know all the etiquette of official visits and all that. Why would a wizard's apprentice from a backward town like Erald's Grove need that stuff? He shook his head. So now, after rising before dawn and riding at a swift pace, possible only because they didn't need scouts to secure the way, they were at the gates of Kelm's Keep before noon. This was Darion's first actual sight of Lord Brion's manor, and in spite of seeing plenty of wonders in the vales, he was impressed. It was a fortified manor, only in the sense that Lord Brion's ancestors had put up some high and formidable stone walls around the manor and its grounds, walls three stories tall with room for men to walk around on top of them, and observation towers at each corner. Inside the walls, the crenellated walls of the manor sat within manicured gardens. They were rather too confined and geometric for Darion's taste, but as well tended as any he'd seen in Valdemar, though no match for the gardens of Kevala. Lord Brion, his wife, the Lady Ismay, and his son Val were all waiting for them, with a token guard of two bored-looking fellows in Brion's livery. The Taledras had taken pains with their costumes, and now Darion was very glad that they had all put out the effort, for it was obvious that the Lord and Lady had dressed as for an important occasion— Lord Brion, whose hair had gone to salt and pepper gray, wore a fine saffron linen tunic with bands of embroidery at the cuffs and hem, and his crest embroidered on the breast with matching breeches. His wife, gowned in the same saffron linen with a matching headdress, also wore amber and silver jewelry, rings on both hands, bracelets, necklace, belt— Val was dressed a bit more casually, in a plain brown linen shirt, open at the neck, with a sleeveless leather tunic and trues. But it was clear from his scrubbed face and wet hair that he'd interrupted whatever he'd been doing at the time for a wash-up and change of clothing. The group rode up to their hosts, and at Snowfire's nod dismounted as one. Darion stepped forward to make the introductions— 
My lord, he said with a little bow, may I make you known to the elders of Kevaldemar Vale, Starfall Kevala, Snowfire Kevala, both of whom who you met before when you were at Erald's Grove, and Snowfire's lady, Nightwind Kelesia. Lord Brian bowed and waited for Darion to finish the introductions. Here also is Aishan Kelesia, who represents the Hertasi, Tercel Kevala, who speaks for the Daihili, and Hashi Kevala, who speaks for the Kairi. The next three members of the greeting party stepped forward and bowed as Darion introduced them, so that Lord Brion would have name and species linked with the appropriate creature. He did not appear to be surprised that these were animals, so he must have been forewarned. He bowed to them as well. Tercel and Hashi nodded their heads gravely, and Aishan executed a graceful court bow. Kelvrin Kelesia, the Silver Griffin chief, is out in the north scouting, and you will meet him later. And lastly, I will relate what Tercel and Hashi say, if you wish, for they are mind speakers. They can speak into your mind, if you would rather. Darion paused, and Lord Brion coughed. Ah, if you don't mind, I would prefer for you to translate, young sir, the older man said. I've had one experience with that, and, well, I'm a plain man with plain ways, and that was just a bit too uncanny for my taste. Personal preference, no offense intended. He coughed again, giving Darion a penetrating look. And you are? Darion Firkin Kevala Kevaldemar, my lord, he replied steadily, keeping his gaze even as well. Darion? Darion? Lord and lady, youngster, I wouldn't have thought it. Lord Brion laughed with surprise. Look at you. We send off a skinny waif that a good wind would knock over, and he comes back the equal of Val. Well met, young man, and welcome home. To Darion's surprise, Lord Brion grabbed his hand and pumped it vigorously. Damn, but it's good to have you back. We've all felt the lack of a mage sorely since you've been gone. Ah, uh, thank you, sir, Darion replied, rather at a loss as to what else to say. Starfall saved him, stepping smoothly to the fore as Lord Brion let go of Darion's hand. Lord Brion... We are keeping everyone standing here in the sun, and there is much we would like to discuss with you this afternoon. Have we somewhere that we could all adjourn to? Starfall placed a slight emphasis on the word all, and Lord Brion's eyes flickered to Hashi and Tercel. As it's a fine day, the inner court would be very pleasant and private, he replied, so quickly that if Darion hadn't seen his eyes flicker, he'd have thought Lord Brion planned that venue all along. Val and my lady will be joining us, of course. Absolutely, Starfall replied. The more minds, the better the decisions. Val looked startled at that, and Lady Ismay appreciative. Evidently Val was not used to being included in his father's counsels, and Lady Ismay was all too used to being dismissed as insignificant by menfolk. "'If you gentlefolk will come with me, then,' Lord Brion continued, "'we'll settle ourselves in the court, and Ismay can rejoin us after she informs the servants what is toward.' He turned toward the two bored guards. And you fellows can be about your business. Mind that you tell the weapons master that I dismissed you on seeing that the wicked Hawk brothers were not about to fall on us and murder us. Both men laughed, as if hearing the tagline of a joke, and sauntered off, leaving the Kevaldemar party to follow Lord Brion. He guided them along the paths of the precisely manicured garden, around the side of the manor, until they came to a small archway leading deep under the second floor. 
At the other end of the tunnel, sun and greenery looked very enticing, though Darion noted the series of strong portcullis gates and drop doors and the murder holes in the ceiling above. Anyone who thought this would be a weak point in the manor's defenses would have a rude surprise shortly before coming down with a serious case of death. They emerged from the dark tunnel, blinking in the sunlight, surrounded by flowers. Here in the inner court was what was often called the Lady's Bower at other Valdemaran manors. The more delicate and frost-sensitive plants and trees were here, and in addition to these there was a profusion of roses and lavender, lilies and hyacinth. A little less manicured than the gardens outside, flowering vines trained on trellises overhung nooks with inviting cushions in them. Rose trees, quince trees, cherry and apple trees showered the grass with petals. Trees were espaliered against the warm stone walls. All of this surrounded a pool full of water lilies and slow, lazy, golden fish. Here and there a bit of forgotten handiwork showed that this was a favored retreat for Lady Ismay and whatever young women attended her. It made a fine place for a conference, too. Soon after everyone settled down, the lady herself appeared, with servants bearing the components of a picnic lunch. Nor were Tercel and Hashi forgotten. For Hashi, there was a bowl of neatly cubed raw meat, probably so that no one had to watch him tear his food from the bone, and for Tercel, a large basin of sweet feed. The bowl and the basin were both of ceramic, clearly from the kitchen and not the stable, serving bowls with Lord Brian's crest glazed onto them. Both Hashi and Tercel expressed their pleasure through Darion. Once food was handed round, Lord Brian dismissed the servants with a gesture and got down to business. "'I've been kept abreast of the situation,' he said." Though, since the message came by bird, there wasn't as much detail as I'd have liked. So there are more barbarians coming this way? Starfall nodded. We have little more in the way of detail than you, but there is one difference from the last time. These people include women and children, as well as the warriors, and herds of various cattle, as well as war mounts. Sounds as if they're planning to stay wherever it is that they're going, Lord Brian frowned. We have a bit of a quandary here. It's the official royal policy that peaceful groups be allowed to settle on unoccupied lands, and there is plenty of that hereabouts. At the same time, though, the last lot of these folk to come down out of the north were anything but peaceful. Do we defend ourselves with a quick preemptive strike, or do we wait and see what they do? Darion kept his mouth shut, although his own feelings were quite clear. He would much prefer an attack, enough to send these people back where they came from. He could tell by the look on Val's face that he felt the same. It was gratifying that Lord Brian treated them all as allies and equals right from the beginning, though. Darion hoped that his advice had something to do with that. "'We should take our time in considering, my lord,' Snowfire said smoothly. "'They aren't within the distance that a griffin can fly in half a day, and they are traveling slowly, so we will have that time.' "'Huh.' What we really need is more information, Lord Brian agreed. I don't like walking into any situation blind. He laughed suddenly. As you said, we have the time, and there are other things to discuss. For example, what sorts of building materials are you short of, and what are you prepared to trade for them? The discussion moved into less martial matters, from trading for building supplies to Dihili grazing grounds, and the need to keep hunters out of them unless escorted by Taledras. 
Darion spoke for Tercel and Hashi, and occasionally for himself, and when the meeting was concluded, and Lord Brion expressed his intention of making a return visit, Darion, at least, came away with a feeling of accomplishment. I need your help for an ekele, Aishan told Darion a few mornings after the visit to Lord Brion. Brion's people had brought a train of wagons with some of the building materials that Starfall had negotiated for, and Darion thought Aishan might have been waiting for these for a particular project. I already have Winter Sky and White Thorn, and that will be enough for the things that Hertasi have trouble with. Gladly, Darion replied, bolting the remains of his breakfast. Whose is it? Your teacher's and his entourage, was the surprising reply. He will be here shortly, or so Starfall says, so there is some need for swift work. Did Starfall tell you who my teacher is? Darion asked eagerly, for Starfall had been singularly close-mouthed about the identity of this mysterious being. No matter how often Darion asked, or how often he tried to catch Starfall off his guard with the question, the mage would only answer, You'll see soon enough. No, Aishan replied indifferently. He only told me what sort of quarters your teacher would need to feel comfortable. Does it matter? Darion sighed. I suppose not. Well, what have you got in mind for me? Pounding earth for the moment, was the predictable reply. So Darion found himself on the top of yet another embryonic wall, ram in both hands, pounding away for all he was worth. But although this dwelling was for one or two occupants, it had a great deal in common with the great common hall with its multiple pools. This place, too, was evidently to have multiple cascading pools, judging by the work the Hertasi were doing on the interior. But there was more building going on in the tree above, and that was curious. Why would there be two dwellings here? Gradually, as the walls in the ground-level portion rose, Darion saw the skeleton of the dwelling coming together. This was to be a very special place, half tree-dwelling, half on the ground. By the second day, Darion began to wonder about this teacher of his— for what they were building, by Kevaldemar standards, was a veritable palace. On the ground was a tiny version of the communal hall, with the same transparent roof, exotic plantings, and a collection of three small pools. The floors were all tiled, and the pools as well. There was a bathing room, and two other chambers that did not share the transparent roof, chambers that looked a great deal like his own bedroom— though what purpose these chambers were to serve was unclear to him. In the tree above was a standard ekele, to the Kevaldemar standards, that is, with thick insulation against winter's cold, and yet not quite standard for where others were making do with walls of rough plank until they had time to carve and polish the interiors of their ekele to their liking, this place boasted fine walnut paneling, with mouldings of carved oak. Everywhere were touches of care that had not been given to the dwellings of other folk. Even more telling, once the ekele was finished, Hertasi began moving in furnishings that looked newly made, yet did not move any personal belongings." All of this preparation did nothing to ease Darion's anxiety, for the newcomer must surely be important if so much time and effort was going into his dwelling. When the place was finished, it was a tiny jewel of comfort and luxury, with the ekele above joined to the chambers below by an enclosed stair and no one in the entire vale showed any envy of the unknown who was to occupy it. Darion did not have to endure the suspense for long. That very afternoon, his mysterious teacher arrived. 
You're to come to the Vale entrance at once, was all the Herr Tassi would say. Please, and dress well. Starfall wishes this. Then it ran off, as if it had been sent on more than one errand. Probably it had, so Darion made certain that he was reasonably well-groomed and hurried to the entrance marked by the twin pillars of rock. Starfall was already there, and so were Snowfire, Nightwind, Aishin, Kel, Tercel, Hashi, virtually everyone of any importance in fledgling Kevaldemar. Suddenly Darion wished he had taken the time to change his tunic. Not that it was dirty or even shabby, but he wished he'd put on the armor of fine clothing before he came to this meeting. It was too late now, for in the distance, tiny beneath the huge trees, dwarfed by the enormous trunks, were two figures mounted on Daihili. A snow-white bird flew over the head of one, a bird that simply could not be a raptor. Its tail was too long, and even at a distance it didn't look or fly like anything Darion had ever seen before. It flew aerobatically, as if it flew purely for the joy of flight. Yet there was a palpable tie between it and the rider it hovered over, as if the bond between it and the rider was visible and tangible. There was something odd about the rider's head. A moment more, and Darion knew what it was. No human face was that flat or that colorful. The rider wore a mask. Another moment, another furlong nearer, and Darion saw more details. Long silver hair, hair that probably fell to the rider's waist when unbound, had been made up into a single long braid for travel, now tossed over his right shoulder. The mask of painted leather covered the entire face, and it represented the face of the bird flying above him. Darion only prevented his mouth from dropping open by force of will. Oh, no, it can't be. The rider's costume was as fantastic as his mask, yet completely practical for a long ride, the ride from Kevala to Kevaldemar, for instance. The garments were cut and pieced together to imitate the plumage of his white bird. It was truly an uncanny imitation. The other rider, in his way, was just as striking as the first. His long hair, also braided, was a shining black with a single silver streak running from the temple. The cut of his riding gear was unmistakably Kaledain. After several months in Kevala, Darion knew the difference between Taledras and Kaledain's styles at once. He was amazingly handsome but there was nothing about him that suggested that he was either a warrior or a mage, or vain. Whatever his craft, it seemed likely that his only reason for being there was as company for the mage. Was this the so-called entourage? Darion's thoughts had come to a complete standstill, and he could only stay where he was, staring. The two riders completed their leisurely approach, and the first dismounted directly in front of Starfall. "'Well, father, here I am,' the rider said, in a voice rich with amusement. "'You have managed to drag me here entirely against my own better judgment, and if I did not know you as well as I do, I might be asking you what made you think this youngster was worth the effort of hauling me up from the south. He cast a sidelong glance at Darion, and behind the mask one silver eye winked broadly. However, since I know you, I shan't ask that particular question. This, I take it, is young Darion? It is indeed, Starfall replied, in a voice so like the riders that it was obvious they were related. Darion, this is your new teacher, adept Firesong Ketreva, and his mate, Kestra Chern Silverfox Kelesia. Only then did he step forward, and he and his son embraced with much hugging and back-pounding. 
Darion managed to scramble enough wits together to step forward and make a deeply formal bow. This is beyond an honor, sir, he began, searching frantically for appropriate words, feeling heat rising in his face and ears. I must be blushing as red as a scarlet jay, he thought, increasing his embarrassment. You won't say that when you come to know me, youngster, Firesong said, with a voice so solemn that Darion would have been tempted to believe him had he not seen the wicked amusement in the eyes behind the mask. I am a notorious taskmaster, and I have every intention of working you until you drop, then reviving you and putting you through the mill all over again. Yes, sir, whatever you wish, sir, Darion replied automatically, and quickly stepped back, hoping that the other folk would forget about him for a while. He suddenly felt as awkward as an elk calf, and only thirteen years old again. Dear gods, how did this happen? How could I be the student of one of the greatest adepts in a dozen countries? He slowly regained a little composure as people did appear to forget him. Father and son embraced again. Starfall introduced Firesong and Silver Fox to everyone else present, and the entire group drifted toward the interior of the Vale. Darion followed quietly behind, listening, but not saying anything. Oh, I didn't bring all that much up with me, Firesong was saying, in answer to a gentle jibe by his father. We've got some wardrobe, and the more portable of Silver Fox's kit. The rest is relatively light, but bulky, and the Kevala Griffins will be bringing it along at some point. After all your emphasis on speed, I didn't want to slow things down bringing baggage by Daihili. We have prepared your ekele as you requested, Fire Song, Aishin put in, showing deference but not servility. I hope that you and Silver Fox are both pleased. Silver Fox, who until that moment had not said a word, laughed softly and clapped Aishin on the back. I remember your talent at design and construction from White Griffin, Aishin. I have no doubt that you have not only granted our every wish, but anticipated needs we had not even thought of. Darion, meanwhile, felt his mind slowly coming back to him. No wonder no one would tell him who his teacher was supposed to be. He'd have been so terrified, he probably would have run all the way back to Kevala, or even farther. And Starfall was Firesong's father. Well, that explained a few things. How Starfall had managed to get someone as famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, as Firesong Ketreva to come be the teacher of poor, lowly little Darion, for one. God save me! How can I ever manage to be worthy of this kind of attention? He thought in a haze of confusion that bordered on panic. Just as he began to seriously consider that run to Kevala, Firesong's companion dropped back from the rest. He mumbles in his sleep, you know, Silver Fox said conversationally. He what? Darion replied, baffled. Where did that come from? He mumbles in his sleep. He has a terrible weakness for candied yams, and he can never remember where he leaves things. He's human, Darion. He's not a superior being. He is as fallible as anyone. I know that at this point this doesn't seem likely to you, but I assure you it's true. Silver Fox placed his hand gently on Darion's shoulder, and Darion felt himself relax, despite his anxieties. I can also promise you that in spite of all his protests to the contrary, he was quite eager to come here and teach his father's cherished protégé. Firesong just likes to be coaxed. I, I'd think that after everything he's gone through, he deserves coaxing, sir. Darion replied shyly and was rewarded by Silver Fox's dazzling smile. And I agree with you entirely, 
Silver Fox chuckled, patting Darion's shoulder. I would agree with you, even if I were not understandably prejudiced on his part. Don't fear him, Darion. Listen to him. Learn from him. But do not fear him. The strange white bird floated down to land on Firesong's shoulder. He reached up absently to scratch its crest, and it climbed down from its perch to nestle in his arms, head tucked blissfully under his chin, crooning. A firebird, Darion now recalled. Firesong's bond bird is a firebird. The horrid painting that had been on Justin's wall flashed into his mind, and the blob on the painted fire song's shoulder that everyone in Erald's Grove had thought was a chicken or a goose. A good many things now made perfect sense. The special arrangement of heated pools, for instance. Everyone knew that the reason Firesong wore masks was because he had been terribly scarred at the end of the mage storms. Presumably, he was shy about exposing those scars to anyone but the closest of companions. And you couldn't wear a mask to soak in the pools. You'd ruin it. Silver Fox might well feel more comfortable in a ground dwelling, especially in a storm when the tree would sway and toss, hence the extra rooms below. And both of them were giving up a considerable level of luxury to come here only for the purpose of teaching Darion. Under other circumstances, it would have been perfectly reasonable for Firesong to insist that Darion be sent to him. No wonder so much effort had been spent on building his Ekele. And of course, who wouldn't want to impress the fabled adept Firesong with the finest Ekele it was possible to build? No matter how poor it was compared to what he had left, at least it would be clear that they had tried. But when Firesong came to the new Ekele, he stopped and turned to his father. Surely this is not ours, he began. His voice reflected surprise, not disdain. It is, Starfall replied, a hint of satisfaction in his voice. We may not have a fully charged hearthstone or a veil to hold back the weather, but we have power enough and skill enough to give you comfort. You will find your own pools here below, a bathing room, a steam room, and a room for Silver Fox to receive clients. I am mostly retired, but I still do take massage clients, Silver Fox said smoothly, as Firesong choked. There had been something implied that Darion didn't understand, but he had a good idea that Kel could tell him, and would. I have well insulated the Ekele, adept fire song, Aishan said diffidently. I do not think you will find any chills or drafts this winter. The adept seemed charmed, pleased, and just a little surprised. I am not sure what to say, fire song replied at length, except to thank you. Thank you all. You have more than made us welcome. Oh, I am certain that you will find plenty to complain of, Starfall laughed. But until you do, I hope you find your new Ekele satisfactory. And on that note, we will leave you to settle in. As Darion was about to leave, Firesong turned to him and summoned him with a crooked finger. Come up with us, the adept said. I would like to talk with you a little. Darion swallowed, felt his mouth go dry as old snakeskin, and obediently followed the two into the ground level of the structure. They paused long enough for a glance around the pool room. Fire Song nodded as Silver Fox exclaimed in pleasure. When the plantings get their full growth, this will be enchanting, Fire Song observed warmly. I cannot believe that they have gone to such trouble for us, Silver Fox replied, shaking his head. Then he laughed. Well, perhaps they have heard tales of your famous plaints when you lived in Valdemar and had none of the niceties of a veil at your disposal. That could well be, 
Fire Song agreed, with as much humor as Silver Fox. He found the staircase and began climbing it, with his partner and Darion close behind. Darion had not seen the Ikele since the furniture was moved in. As he entered behind the other two, he saw that not only had furnishings been put in place, but there were beautifully woven rugs on the floor and hangings on the walls. Silver Fox went briefly to the window, then looked back at Fire Song. I think I will see the chambers on the ground first. If there is a storm, I still do not care for being in the boughs of a tree. Only one who was raised in a tree could, Ashke. So if there is a storm, I can understand, Fire Song chuckled. For that matter, if there is a storm, you may find me joining you below. Silver Fox saluted them both, and then descended the stairs noiselessly, and Fire Song gestured to Darion to take a seat. Gingerly, Darion sat down on a chair woven of willow withes, and Fire Song took another just like it, placed opposite him. The adept leaned back in the chair, relaxing as the withes creaked, settling beneath his slight weight, but Darion remained sitting straight upright, back and shoulders staff stiff. He had no idea what to expect, and wondered desperately what Fire Song expected of him. He couldn't look away from those silver eyes. So, Fire Song said, after he'd watched Darion carefully for a time, being a mage, becoming an adept, was this your idea, or someone else's? If I'd had a choice, you mean, Darion hazarded, in the very beginning? Fire Song nodded. If I'd had a choice originally, I'd just be a trapper like my parents, Darion said softly. After my parents died, I was apprenticed without anyone asking me what I wanted. I'd rather have been apprenticed to the village woodcutter. I didn't want to be a mage. I didn't want anything to do with magic. I couldn't see any use for it. To his great surprise, Fire Song burst out laughing so hard that he started to cough and had to get control of himself before he could talk again. You couldn't see any use for it, he rasped out at last, shaking his head and dabbing at his eyes with a silken handkerchief. Well, at least I won't have to disabuse you of dreams of easy glory. But I forget, you never saw any really powerful magic, did you? Not with my original master, Darion replied truthfully. Once the mage storms began, I don't think he could do much of anything. He certainly couldn't change, steer, or even predict the weather, and that might have impressed me that magic had some uses. That was Wizard Justin. Justin, Justin. Fire Song muttered, eyes intent as he concentrated. I think I may have met him once. Name sticks in my mind. He closed his eyes, then opened them again. I think I have it. It would be right after the end of the Ankar Falcon's Bane debacle, I think. Mercenary mage got a head wound doing something ridiculously heroic, lost most of his powers, and got talked into using what he had as a healer out where they didn't have one. Some place in the middle of nowhere. A very nice nowhere you have here, by the way. I love what you've done with the place. He was part of a group of similarly retrained folk. Not a big group, though. Darkwind, Elspeth, and I met with him before they got sent out to new posts. Your Justin wound up out here, obviously. Am I right? Darion's mouth fell open. He couldn't help it. Firesong had just told him more about his own master than he himself had known. He could only nod in astonished confirmation and felt embarrassed that he had known so little about Justin. So he really did meet the people he claimed he had, and we never believed him. How did you know, he asked. How could you remember after all this time? Firesong shrugged. 
I can't help it. I almost never forget a face or a name, but I can't remember where I left my boots. Well, at least I won't have to disabuse you of any grandiose schemes for becoming a wizard king. That's a relief, anyway. Tales notwithstanding, I'm afraid there aren't many kingdoms going without claimants. What have you done and learned while you were with Adept Starfall and Mage Firefrost? How have they been educating you? Darion told him as succinctly as he could. It really wasn't difficult, since he and Firesong shared the same kind of magical education. Firesong listened, nodding from time to time, and said at the end, You've had a good, solid education, but that's to be expected with my father teaching you. You said that originally, if you'd had the choice, you wouldn't have chosen magic. What about now? If I could remove it from you, is that what you'd want? Then he said something else that shocked Darion, I can, you know. That's one of the things a healing adept can still do, and I suspect that's one of the reasons why Father wanted me here. If having this power really bothers you still, I can take it away. Once again, Darion was caught off guard by the unexpected question and answered without thinking. Uh, no, not now. It seems as if it's something I should do. He shook his head, unable to come up with anything that sounded right. I guess I haven't thought about it, about having a choice, I mean. There didn't seem to be one. There is a choice, Firesong said somberly, and I want to give you one, an informed choice. There's something more I want to show you before you make that choice. Before Darion had any idea of what the adept was up to, Firesong had reached up and removed his mask. Darion blinked, but did not turn away or lower his eyes. In many ways, the scar-seamed face behind the mask was not as horrific as it could have been. It certainly wasn't pretty, or rather, the fact that it was the ruin of something that had once been handsome was actually painful to think about. The silver eyes looked out of a randomly patterned set of shiny, tight patches divided by thick red scars, something that was nearly another mask. It wouldn't give nightmares to children. Not screaming nightmares, anyway. Maybe bad dreams, though. There is often a price to wielding great magic, Derion, the scar-twisted lips said. This was mine. Envoy Karal paid with his sight. Two more of our party paid with their lives. I was very, very lucky when it came down to cases. I could easily have died as well, had I not been protected by one of those who did. I had, thanks to the gods who sent Silver Fox, learned that there were far more important things than having a pretty face, and losing it didn't destroy me. I was beautiful, the scarred lips smiled. I still am. I don't wear masks for my own sake, but the sake of others, so that they need not feel pain that I myself no longer experience, but Darion. Had I not learned things about what is important by then, this minor price could have been a very major one. Have you thought about that, the possibility that you too might be asked to pay a great price for power? While Darion sat in silence, Firesong put his mask back on again. What about not using it? he asked finally. There's a price for inaction, too. The trouble is, usually other people get caught in paying it as much as you do. At least, if I keep this gift and use whatever power I have, I'll be making the choice to act, instead of just standing by and wringing my hands. Behind the mask, the eyes closed for a moment. That is a good answer, and, I might add, one I've not heard before. 
It should have been obvious you aren't the kind of young man to choose inaction. The silver eyes opened again, and there was a smile in the voice. Young Derion Firkin Kevala Kevaldemar, you have passed my test. I will be quite pleased to have you as my student, and to teach you all I can, until you have achieved everything possible within the limits of your gift, or you drop from exhaustion. Have I passed your test as well? Slowly, Darion nodded. I think you won't be an easy teacher, but you'll be a good one. I think we can get along. Firesong chuckled. You'd be surprised at how few people realize that is important for teacher and pupil. One more thing before I let you go for the day. If ever there is something that you are afraid to tell me, do not hesitate to confide it in Silver Fox. That, in part, is his profession, to be a trustworthy confidant. I will, sir, Darion replied, knowing a dismissal when he heard one. He stood up, and as he was about to leave the room, Firesong motioned to him to stay. Darion, I have one request, he sighed, and Darion wondered if he'd done something wrong already. Do me the very great favor of never calling me sir again. Don't call me master, either. Call me Firesong. His eyes grew mournful. Being called sir makes me feel so old. Yes, sir, Firesong, Darion replied quickly. But I've come to respect those who are wiser than I am, and I only meant it as a compliment. Hmm. Well, in that case, I'll let it pass once in a while, Firesong replied. Darion went out the door and down the covered stair, unable to tell if Firesong was serious or had been teasing him. He decided to walk at the edge of the small lake that lay just beneath the cliff housing Kell's Eyrie and Snowfire and Nightwind's home. Darion was so preoccupied with sorting out his thoughts that he practically walked into Snowfire and Nightwind. Darion, wake up, Nightwind called, startling him into looking up. She smiled at him, and he smiled back sheepishly. Sorry, he said, coming over to join them. They were dangling their feet in the water like a couple of youngsters. I was thinking, I was just, well... I was talking to Firesong, or he was talking to me, I mean, and I have a lot to think about. Hmm, I should imagine, Nightwind replied. I know Silver Fox, of course, a very fine Kestra Churn, by the way, but I'd never met Firesong. I must admit to you that when I heard who your teacher was going to be, I was not anticipating being as impressed as I was. You too, Snowfire said with astonishment. I knew his reputation, and I rather thought he'd be something of a pain. I figured he'd have a tantrum when he saw his Ekele, and as for training Darion, no matter what Starfall said, I thought he'd be very haughty about it. He's not like that at all, Darion began. I agree, I agree, Snowfire replied hastily. I agree completely. I don't know what's happened to him since he made that particular reputation, but he certainly doesn't deserve it any more. I know what's happened, Nightwind replied with a cynical half-smile. Silver Fox is what happened. He could humanize a monster. A step behind Darion, and Nightwind's sudden blush made Darion look around. Silver Fox had just stolen up upon them in time to hear that last remark, and his grin at Nightwind's embarrassment was full of mischievous charm. So, do you have any monsters you need tamed? His grin widened. Less of that is my doing than you might think, my dear, he said genially. 
Behind all those exquisite masks is a very real and generous man whose humanity has never been in doubt. He simply had to reconcile himself to the fact that he didn't have to wear the masks on his heart, only his face. Come here, you wicked creature, Nightwind replied, leaping to her feet and holding out her arms. Give me a proper greeting. So little Nightwind still wants a hug from Uncle Silver Fox, the Kestra Churn teased. He did go to her and give her the greeting hug she wanted, though, and then clasped hands with Snowfire. I am very pleased to meet you, may I add, he went on. We stopped long enough at Kevala that I managed to hear of your joining with my old friend, and I was quite anxious to meet the fellow capable of swerving her from her childhood vow never to wed anyone at all. Silver Fox, I was only twelve, she objected, laughing. You seemed quite serious at the time, my dear, Silver Fox replied, and turned back toward Darion, who was edging away, thinking that he was intruding. Please, Darion, come join us. I had come specifically to talk to you a little more. You're sure I won't be in the way? he asked. Snowfire and Nightwind both beckoned, and Silver Fox smiled. Not at all. A great deal of what I wanted to discuss with you concerns these two as well, since I am told they are your oldest friends here, and it is about Firesong. I should like you three to know more about him, as he will be a part of Kevaldemar for some time to come, perhaps longer than even he anticipates. Snowfire raised a quizzical eyebrow, you think he might stay? Silver Fox only shrugged. I cannot predict. I can only say that until a reason for him to leave should manifest, he will remain, and if none does... Interesting. Nightwind found another soft spot on the bank to sit and invited Silver Fox to take her earlier perch. So what is it that has turned your fire song into a paragon? Time, trials, and being forced to work with a fraction of the power that he was used to having, Silver Fox said casually. No more great magics for him or for anyone. Every bit of magic has to be carefully planned to gain the maximum benefit from the minimum of power. That has forced him to be patient, careful, restrained. He can no longer afford to act on impulse, almost a shame, since he had turned impulsiveness into an art form. In short, he grew up, Snowfire snorted, then blushed. I'm sorry, that was entirely uncharitable. Not entirely wrong, but very uncharitable, Silver Fox agreed. I ask you to try to recall that his reputation was made in the days when he could afford to send up a gate just because he preferred not to ride a single day's journey, and no small part of that reputation was caused by his own insatiable urge to tweak the noses of others, so to speak. Silver Fox trailed his fingers in the water meditatively, then added, he still has that sense of humor, but he has learned to express it in ways that are more humorous. I detect your delicate hand there, Nightwind chuckled. Silver Fox's only response to that was an odd look. I told him that I thought we'd get along all right, sir, Darion offered. I still do, and I think I like him, too. Good. That was what I was hoping to hear you say, Silver Fox applauded. Have you any questions? Uh, one, Darion decided to just come out and ask it. What exactly is a Kestra churn, and why did Firesong choke when Starfall mentioned your clients? Nightwind suddenly developed a fit of coughing. Silver Fox quelled her with a look. A Kestra churn is predominantly one who comforts Darion, 
Silver Fox said, taking care with his words. That is the profession. The least that a Kestrachern does is to supply ease, a distraction, and an absolutely trustworthy confidant. The best of us are in part healers, healers of the mind and spirit rather than of the body, although we have some skills there and are often asked to help healers when they are short-handed. Sometimes that leads to some very intimate contact, for sometimes it is easiest to lead someone to open his heart when he has been intimate in body. That is not always, or even often, the case. It truly depends on the Kestra churn. Darion was perfectly capable of reading between the lines, but he also thought about Lily, how she had used her crude skills to keep the barbarians occupied with her and away from the village girls, and he made a mental note to tell Silver Fox about her at some point. As for why Firesong choked, now Silver Fox grinned. Starfall initially had a, how shall I put this, a somewhat narrow and distorted view of my profession, and said some misguided things about my relationship with Firesong. Starfall nearly had a litter of kittens, Nightwind said rudely, and what he said doesn't bear repeating. Needless to say, several of your Kelesia compatriots had some choice words with him when we found out. Oh, oh! Now Darion understood Firesong's reaction, hearing his father go from disapproval to calmly mentioning a room for Silver Fox's clients. I think I'd have choked, too. Snowfire snickered. There was no other word for the sound he made. Don't misunderstand me, he said. I admire Starfall immensely, but he has been known to get pig-headed about some things. So you will recognize the same trait in the sun, Silver Fox said smoothly. I am glad, however, that there are no misunderstandings now. We have a full plate, which will be fuller yet if those threatened barbarians should appear. They all nodded, but it was Darion who broke the silence that followed that statement— I've put it off long enough, I guess, he said, mostly to snow fire and night wind. I'd better take care of one last thing before I discover I haven't got the time for it. What's that? Snowfire asked. Darion made a face of distaste. Tomorrow, I'd better put in an official appearance in Erold's Grove. 9. Keisha kept herself busy, trying not to miss Shandi too much. Midsummer fair came and went. Keisha stayed away except for a single trip around the traders' booths, with no further signs from the mysterious Hawk Brothers and the absent Darion Firkin, except for the frequent overhead flights of griffins, sometimes bearing burdens, sometimes not. Lord Brion's son came to the fair, representing his father, selected the wedding shawl that had been especially made for him, with no indication that he realized his selection had been carefully steered. Valen of Kelmskeep assured everyone that, yes, the Hawk brothers were in the process of setting up their settlement, and, yes, Darion Firkin was with them. As to when he would reintroduce himself to Erold's Grove, that Val didn't know. He had seen them, met with them on several occasions, even been to their settlement, so he could at least testify to that much. Keisha didn't much blame Darion for not showing up immediately and putting himself at the disposal of the village. If she were in his position, she'd give them a great deal of time to settle themselves down before she came to visit. The village of Erold's Grove was entirely too keyed up about the return of their peregrinating son for her liking. 
Fortunately, the excitement of Midsummer Fair, with Val in attendance, twice the usual number of Hawk Brother traders, and several entirely new traders up out of the South, gave the villagers plenty to spend their excitement and money on. Keisha wouldn't have stayed so much away from the fair, but after the first few candle marks, she discovered that she couldn't tolerate the press of people. She retreated to her workshop, discovered during the excitement of the games and contests that even that wasn't far enough, and removed herself to the woods until the contests were over. Increasingly, Keisha suffered from headache, upset stomach, general nervousness when she was around two or more people, and she had no idea how to make it stop. Her best shelters were her workshop and the forest, and of the two, she preferred the forest, for in her workshop she was easy to find, and during the fair people seemed to think it was their duty to coax her to attend. She kept away from her family, too, as much as possible. In fact, even the outwardly peaceable fellowship folk were something of a trial to be around, for beneath their placid exteriors lurked a stew of complicated emotions. Evidently there were some members of the group for whom a placid life and an absence of outward conflict was more of a trial than arguments would have been. Fortunately, she could get her meals without having to stay at the table." She salved her conscience by providing her family with food instead of her physical help, greens and herbs from her garden, other foodstuffs from the bounty given her by her patients. They seemed to fear that now that she was on her own, she was in serious danger of starving to death. Every day saw a rough, temporary container plated of green reeds or made of giant leaves stitched together left on her doorstep, containing something to eat. A loaf of fresh bread, a round pad of fresh churned butter, fresh picked vegetables, a meat or berry pie, a half dozen eggs. If it was edible, it generally ended up in a basket on her doorstep. Sooner or later the bounty would probably dry up, but while it continued, sharing it with her family soothed the pangs of conscience for deserting them. It was just that at the moment it was harder than ever for her to be around them. Two of her brothers were trying to court the same girl, which led to a great deal of masculine head-butting, snorting, and prancing around the dinner table— the youngest two were in the stage of adolescent revolt, which meant a great deal of conflict with her father. Her mum was worried because they'd gotten only two letters from Shandi, and both were very brief. Keisha wasn't at all surprised, considering the daily round of chores and classes Shandi described. Shandi wasn't spoiled, but she'd never had to work this hard in her life. There seemed to be a great deal of book-learning, too, which was not Shandi's strongest suit. Be fair, Keisha. She's not a dunce, either. She would just rather do handiwork than bookwork. At least they'd done the wisest thing at that collegium, so far as Shandi's chore assignments went, and put her to work on sewing and mending for her share of the daily work— by now they had probably discovered that with Shandi's nimble fingers on the job, they didn't need to assign anyone else the sewing tasks. Mum worried, though, and that made Keisha's stomach ache, which made it impossible for her to eat, which made Mum worry more, and, well, Keisha began to look for reasons to be away from the dinner table. It certainly is convenient how many little accidents occur around dinner time. In fact, it was getting so she could find those little accidents before anyone came to fetch her. Granted, though, she was looking for them. But when it came to baby's colic or mother's burned hand, brother's tumble from a tree, father's work-related blisters or sister's bad sunburn, Keisha had never been so attentive to the needs of the village. Small wonder she was getting little gifts left on the doorstep. 
In the afterglow of mingled pleasure and exhaustion that followed the fair, the only topics of discussion among the villagers were vows betrothed, the pledging of two of the village couples, and the resounding success of trading. For the moment, they had forgotten to fret about Darion and the Hawk Brothers, the weather, the harvest, or the level of the river. All of these were safe enough topics not to cause argument, and laden with contentment rather than worry. Keisha woke on the third morning after midsummer, looking forward to a few more days without headaches. She was out in her garden when the unusual sound of hoofbeats on the path behind her made her look up, to find herself staring up at a strange deer-like animal with long curved horns and a hawk brother on its back. She gaped at him stupidly, her mind gone blank. Hela, the rider said cheerfully, in very good Valdemarin. I am looking for someone of authority in Erald's Grove to deliver a message to. Some children sent me here. That, at least, brought her out of her days. She stood up, wiping her hands on her garden smock. The mayor is probably checking the irrigation mill, she said, thinking out loud. I know the priest is visiting a sick farmer. Will I do? I'm sort of the healer. Assuredly, the hawk brother replied. It's simple enough. We of Kevaldemar Vale are finally settled in, and I was told to say that the elders of the Vale and Mage Darion will come tomorrow to present themselves as new neighbors to you. They told me to tell you that there is no need to make a great event of this, of special preparations. We waited until after the fair so as not to disrupt your celebration." She stared at him for a moment before stammering a reply. Ah, uh, that will be fine. Wonderful, she managed. I'll go find the mayor and let him know right now. Who shall I say gave the message? The rider had already given some subtle signal to his mount. It was ten paces back up the path before she got out the last word of her reply. The rider called back over his shoulder. I am Winter Sky Kevala, and thank you for taking the message for me. His beast leaped into a gallop, and he vanished into the forest. She didn't wait any longer herself. The mayor needed to hear this right away. She tore off her smock and left it in the middle of the garden, pelting down the path toward the river as fast as her feet could carry her. She intercepted the mayor and the blacksmith on the path leading to the river. They were on their way back from their weekly inspection of the mill that kept the vegetable fields nearest the village irrigated. The ones on the other side of the river, being at a lower level, could be watered naturally. She waved her arm wildly at him as soon as she saw him and increased her speed. He stopped immediately, a look of worry jumping into his eyes. She might have been running, but not long enough to be the least winded. She didn't wait for him to ask what was wrong. A message came from the Hawk Brothers, sir, she called, as she came to a halt on the path in front of him. The new ones, the new ones with Darion Firkin. They're coming here tomorrow to meet you. The worry changed immediately to pleasure. Finally, he exclaimed. Then the worry returned. But tomorrow? How can we make proper preparations with such short notice? The Hawk Brother, he said he was Winter Sky Kevala, said he was told to tell you that this isn't a formal meeting, that you aren't to make a big fuss over it. But she saw she might just as well have been talking to a wall and stopped trying. The mayor was off in a tangle of plans and preparations, and probably wouldn't believe that the Hawk Brother had said any such thing. In fact, he broke into a trot, heading straight for the village square, probably with the intention of gathering every person of importance in Erald's Grove to see what they could put together for a proper greeting committee. The blacksmith was right behind him, too, but heading for his home. The news was about to spread through the village by the fastest means possible. He was going to tell his wife, who would promptly start the news going in all directions. Wives were better than heralds and companions at getting any news of any kind spread. 
which meant that Keisha could go back to her garden with a good conscience. I only hope it'll continue to stay my garden, she reflected, worried. Darion can't possibly want the cottage back. No, surely not. He's living with the Hawk Brothers. Everyone in the village was awake before dawn. From the great oven of the village baker, who was also the miller, came the scent not only of bread but of roasting meat. From dozens of hearths rose equally appetizing smells. From the other huge oven at the threshing barn came the aroma of cake and pie. Erold's Grove was going to give a feast for Darion and his hawk brothers, whether they wanted one or not. As soon as the first dawn light pierced the morning sky, groups of children streamed past Keisha's cottage, heading for the forest, their voices shrill with excitement. They came back within a candle mark, laden with boughs of greenery and bunches of long trailing vines. Keisha followed them and joined the older children in decorating the square with the greenery, while all the tables and benches that had just been taken back into houses after the fair were brought back out again and set up in the square itself. By mid-morning, most of the preparations were complete. Food that didn't need to be warm had been brought to the temple for later serving, the bowers and decorations were up, banners and flags flew from windows looking out on the square, and a small boy, giddy with pride at his important assignment, was up in the temple tower watching for the first sign of the Hawk Brothers. Keisha's only symptom so far was a knotted stomach and a faint headache. Those she could bear easily enough, so she remained with the rest of the village, waiting in the square. After two false alarms, at mid-morning the shout went up from the tower. They're coming, the boy shrilled. Oh, there's a lot of them, and they're riding on deer. Keisha's stomach lurched, and she faded back into a doorway while the mayor gathered up his cronies and hustled them up onto a low platform left over from the fair at the end nearest the temple. Moments later, the visitors rode into the square. A spontaneous cheer burst out, making their mounts start. The visitors seemed pretty startled, too, at least to Keisha's eyes, but they kept their composure in spite of all the noise. She saw two of the ones in the lead, a thin but good-looking young man about her own age, and a dignified, craggly, handsome older man with long, silver-white hair, put their heads together for a quick consultation. The young man gestured discreetly at the platform, the older man nodded, and they led the entire group toward the waiting mayor. The mayor stood nervously clasping his hands as they approached him and his group. The cheering died down when the visitors dismounted and made the last few steps afoot. The mayor had probably memorized a grand speech, but his efforts were entirely set at naught, for the first words out of his mouth were, by haven, Darion? Is that really you? You're bigger. The younger man laughed and held out his hand, clasping the mayor's firmly. Boys have a habit of growing up, Lutter, he replied, his warm, deep voice very amused. He shook the mayor's hand. What are you, mayor now? Good for you. I'm not surprised. Congratulations. Mayor Lutter flushed, and plainly made the decision to discard his planned speech, since the atmosphere of great dignity and importance he had been trying to establish was spoiled anyway. Good to have you here again. Now, who are these fine folks? Darion introduced them, and Keisha took careful note of their names. The older man was Starfall Kevala, an adept, clearly one of the men in charge, and dressed in a tunic and breeches of exotic color and cut. A fellow who was dressed like the Hawk Brothers she was used to seeing was identified as Snowfire Kevala, and a lady with night-black hair and sharp blue eyes as his mate, Nightwind Kelesia. She was given the title of Trondirin, whatever that was, but the next two to be introduced had every eye in the village fairly popping from its socket, Keisha's included. 
This is healing adept Fire Song Ketreva and the Kestra Churn Silver Fox Kelesia, Darion said proudly, gesturing to the pair. Silver Fox would have startled almost anyone in Erald's Grove with his appearance. His black, silver-streaked hair was so long it touched the back of his knees, and he wore it unbound, flowing as loose as a maiden's. His elaborately brocaded, sleeveless vest of green and teal could only be silk, as were the emerald shirt with its wide sleeves and the matching, tight-fitting breeches. Keisha yearned to examine the silk brocade more closely, and his leather knee boots fit so smoothly they must have been tailored to his legs alone. But Silver Fox paled in comparison with Fire Song. Fire Song's silver hair was just as long as Silver Fox's, but he sported a braid on either side of his face with strands of crystal beads, silver chains, and tiny bells braided into them. His shirt of emerald green was embroidered all over in a pattern of blue, green, and silver feathers. Its pendulous sleeves reached down to his knees, and it was held in close to his body with a silver belt in the form of two birds, whose tails flowed together at the back and whose beaks hooked together in the front. He wore loose-fitting silk breeches tucked into green boots with silver ornaments down each side. But the crowning touch, the object that set him apart from everyone else, was the mask that he wore completely covering his face. It seemed to be of metal, and yet it was far too flexible to be of that substance, patterned in glittering silver with touches of shining emerald and sparkling sapphire, its ornamentation echoed the feather embroidery of his tunic, giving him the look of a fantastic bird. It was the mask that did it, that told her that this was the Fire Song, the famous adept who trained Princess Elspeth, who helped save Valdemar in the Great War, who then helped save it again from the mage storms. I am quite pleased to visit this place, Fire Song was saying, pretending to ignore the fact that he was the center of everyone's gaze. I understand that the wizard who helped to save your village was someone I had the honor of meeting a very long time ago. Justin, wasn't it? Keisha wondered why that casual remark would make Mayor Lutter pale, but the man regained his composure after a moment of coughing. Uh, yes, Wizard Justin. He was young Darion's first master. That's his statue there, facing the bridge, you know. Seemed the most appropriate place, least we could do to honor his memory. Mayor Lutter pointed, and naturally everyone turned to look, in spite of the fact that most people here were as familiar with the statue as they were with the members of their families. Of course, from this angle, all anyone saw was the back of the statue, but at least it was evident that the statue was a pretty good one. It should be, considering it had been done by the same artist who made all the religious statues hereabouts, and not by the fellow that Mayor Lutter originally wanted to hire, a dauber who usually carved and painted in signs. Lutter had been overruled by nearly everyone— Keisha saw Darion nod to himself with a pleased little smile. Mayor Lutter still seemed shaken. Ah, uh, you sent word not to make any special preparations, but we couldn't, you know. We've prepared a feast in your honor, he stammered. The women waiting near the temple took that for an order and started bringing out dishes. Things were a bit confused for a moment. Then the mayor's wife, Mandy, took charge and got everything set to rights and organized. Tables and benches placed on the platform were quickly covered with clean white cloths, and the visitors were guided to their seats. Everyone else scrambled for seats down below as the young women and wives appointed as servers began bringing out food. Keisha would have taken this opportunity to slip away, but Mandy Lutter wasn't having any of that. "'There you are,' said the reedy voice as Keisha tried to ease her way out of the crowd. 
Mandy's thin, hard hand seized her arm, and the mayor's wife pulled Keisha up toward the platform. Keisha wanted to jerk her arm free and run off, but that would have been unbearably rude, so she allowed Mandy to hustle her up onto the platform and into a seat. "'This is Keisha Alder, our healer,' Mandy proclaimed. "'I'm afraid she's a bit shy.' Keisha moved to protest, but was stilled by Mandy's sharp glance. Keisha looked cautiously about and discovered she'd been seated between two of the visitors. Darion was on her right, and the lady with the black hair was on her left. And curiously, as she got control over her own nerves, she realized that the nausea and headache she'd been suffering from ever since she woke up were... gone. Kel will be arriving a little later, the woman was saying to the mayor. He wanted to run his morning patrol before coming here, and that seemed like a wise course to us. Keisha wondered who Kel was, but she didn't get a chance to speculate, for Darion addressed her just as the woman went on to talk about the bond birds. I've been told that you have the old cottage that I used to share with Justin, the young man said, with a friendly enough smile, but immediately Keisha worried. Did he want it back? Yes, she replied carefully. No one was using it. You don't mind, I hope. He chuckled, and his eyes crinkled at the corners. Why should I mind? It's nice to know it isn't sitting empty, or worse, fallen into a ruin. I just hope you've managed to make more of it than we did. People fixed it up for me. They fixed the walls, the roof, everything, she told him, and hesitated a moment. I don't suppose you'd want to see it, would you? His face lit up with his smile. Actually, yes, I would, quite a bit. I was trying to think of a way to ask you if I could. I will, if you'll let me see the griffin up close, she said, suddenly thinking of a way to achieve her own wish. Now Darion laughed. Let? Havens, when he comes in from patrol, you'll have a hard time keeping him away. If there's one thing that Kel loves, it's an audience. That led her to questions about griffins in general, and Kel, or Kelvrin, as his name really was, in particular— Darion was perfectly willing to answer them, and while he was talking, she didn't have to. Darion was a vast improvement over her brothers, both in manners and appearance. He never interrupted, passed platters without being asked, offered food to her before taking some himself, and never heaped his plate with the best cuts— he used knife and fork properly, didn't wipe his mouth on his cuff, and didn't make sarcastic or cutting remarks, even when Mayor Lutter was holding forth with great pomposity on things he obviously knew nothing about. When that happened, he just exchanged looks with others of his party and hid his smile by turning his head. As for appearance, well, Keisha didn't blame the rest of the girls for competing to serve him, nor did she blame them for their posing, their flirtatious glances, their outright adoration in some cases. He was really one of the best-looking young men she'd ever seen, and the leather Hawk Brother clothing with its fringes, beadwork, and tooling only gave him an exotic touch that was very attractive. He seemed completely oblivious to their attempts to catch his eye, though. Mature and self-possessed, he managed to pay attention to Keisha's questions and to the discussions that the Hawk Brother elders and the village officials were having at the same time. She was used to having to listen to more than one conversation at the same time, since she often had two or more people babbling at her about an illness or injury, but she'd never known anyone else to have that gift. Well, maybe he's too busy with that to pay any attention to the girls, or maybe he's used to admiration. At least he doesn't seem vain about it, if he is. The bond birds are mostly in the trees around the edge of the village right now, he said in answer to her last question. No reason to call them in, and too many strangers make some of them nervous. Fire song is enough strangeness for all of you to handle, I think. You have a bird, don't you? she asked. 
Of course, I couldn't be a hawk brother without one, he laughed. His name is Kuari, and he's an owl. He's fledged of Snowfire's two birds. When we've got lots of space, I'll call him in if you'd like to see him. He is really far too big to call into a crowd. What's it like having a bond bird? she asked curiously. Is it something like having a companion? Huh, a bit, I'd guess. The bond strengthens with time. In the beginning, you have to work to talk to them, but after a year or so, they're always in your head, and you'd have to work to keep them out, assuming you'd want to. He raised his eyebrows. I can't imagine why anyone would want to, though. They're so different from humans that it isn't like having someone eavesdropping on you. He warmed to his subject. Their needs are very different from a human's, and their interests, it's only because they are bred to be extremely intelligent that they have much in common with us at all. Have you ever been around ordinary birds of prey at all? Not really, she admitted. In fact, the only raptors I've ever seen up close have been a couple of bond birds, the ones that come with hawk brothers who've brought things to trade. She offered a slow smile. I really like Steel Mine's buzzard. He's so calm. He chuckled. You haven't missed much with ordinary raptors. Oh, they are beautiful, graceful, and amazing to watch, but there isn't much room in those heads for anything except hunting, breeding, and survival skills. They're very focused. That's the way Nightwind puts it. Bond birds are less focused, but they do have intelligence and the ability to socialize, and not just with us. They play games and socialize with other bond birds, and not just of the same breed. They have to be able to do that, or they couldn't work together, and too many of them would be on the dinner menu for the biggest of them if they didn't have that ability to tell friend from food. She stifled a laugh. I never thought about it that way. Believe me, it's quite true. His attention wandered for a moment as he caught part of one of the other ongoing conversations. It was only for a moment, though, and it came right back to her. When you see the size of Kuari, you'll understand. Honestly, I'm not strong enough to hold him for long without something to help support his weight. That candid remark surprised and charmed her. She couldn't imagine any of the young men she knew admitting they weren't strong enough to do something. By this time, the meal was just about over. The last of the dishes were whisked away to make way for bowls of fruit and pitchers of wine. Would you like to see the cottage now? she asked, and when he hesitated, she assured him, There won't be any serious talk going on yet. Mayor Lutter won't want any real discussions of anything happening in front of the whole village. She listened a moment to the mayor's current topic, the past midsummer fair. He's on the fair. The next thing will be the harvest and the number of traders he expects. He'll be priming your people for suggestions later about what they might bring to trade on a regular schedule. You can see the cottage and be back before he gets on to the next thing. That sounds fine. Let's slip off. He rose from his seat at the same time that she did. He set out in exactly the right direction, and it took her a moment to remember that he had lived here for years, so of course he would know where the cottage was. Well, he exclaimed, as they approached the workshop, you were right about people fixing it up. It certainly never looked this good when I lived here. She felt a bit of pardonable pride, for it was a neat little place now, with the stone walls scrubbed and morning glories and moonflower vines climbing up the trellises she'd built on either side of the door. The thatch had been patched and freshly trimmed last fall, too, and this spring she'd painted the shutters white. Show me around the outside first, Darion urged. Always happy to show off her garden, Keisha took him around to the back. Oh, this is good, he exclaimed, as the garden came into view. What have you got here? Without waiting for her reply, he walked carefully around the beds, identifying plants aloud. Feverfew, wormwood, basil, thyme, lobelia, comfrey... Keisha was impressed, for she would never have thought he'd have any knowledge of herbs. 
I must say, I'm glad Justin didn't have all this. Why? she asked, startled. Because then I wouldn't have had so many excuses to go out into the forest, he replied with perfect logic. Keisha, you've done some remarkable things here. This is wonderful from the point of view of having supplies at hand. And to trade, she pointed out, I'm able to get some things by swapping with traders that come here. Perfume oils are popular, and dyes, of course. Of course. He took another long look around the garden, nodding. So why don't you show me what you've done with the inside? His grin, as soon as he entered the door, made her flush with pride, and she was very glad she'd cleaned everything thoroughly last night. Good job. Really good job. You've made this place into a fine home and workshop. I had help, she began shyly, but he shook his head. I see one person's hand everywhere, he began, but a tap on the door frame interrupted him. The Hawk Brother woman, Nightwind, stood there. She said something quickly in the Hawk Brother tongue. He nodded and turned back to Keisha. Nightwind says that Lutter wants to speak with me, and she wants to have a word with you, he told her. Right now, she says, while things are still quiet. Me? she squeaked, surprised once again. Why? He shrugged helplessly. I suspect that's to be between Nightwind and you. I'll see you later, when Kel comes in. With that, he slipped past Nightwind, who entered and closed the door behind her. You need not look so apprehensive, the woman said, in slow, careful Valdemarin. I think that this may be a very welcome conversation for you. Keisha swallowed and recalled her manners. Will you sit down? Can I offer you something to drink? After that feast, Nightwind laughed. Thank you, but no. I shall sit, however. She took one of the two chairs at the cold hearth. Warily, Keisha took the other. I have spoken with Healer Gill, Nightwind said, with no warning, and Keisha stifled a groan. Nay, do not look so stricken. I am a kind of healer, as is adept Firesong. We believe that together we can supply the teaching that you lack. Before Keisha had time to react, Nightwind went on. You do not know how close you came to turning into a hermit, she said soberly. You have been feeling unwell around others, have you not? That is because you have never learned to shield. Shields? You know what that means? Keisha was too excited by this to be annoyed and embarrassed now. I haven't been able to make any sense out of what was in the books, and I knew it was important, but Gil couldn't explain, and she stopped herself, took a deep breath, and told herself to calm down. So that is why I get upset when other people are upset? Exactly. Nightwind relaxed just a trifle. And you will be getting your first lesson from me right now. I put a shield around you at the feast. Now you will learn to make your own. She studied Keisha's face. I think you will learn quickly, and it is a good thing that you are a healer rather than an empath. You already are grounded and centered. Those were two more terms that hadn't been explained in the healer's texts. What does that mean? she asked, determined to indeed begin her lessons at once. When you are working here, when you are in the forest, you feel a strong connection to the earth, do you not? Nightwind asked, and Keisha nodded eagerly. I've never even dreamed of flying, she confessed. I dream about being a tree, a really huge tree, with roots going all the way down into the heart of the earth. Empaths must learn to ground and center themselves, to create that connection to the earth, Nightwind told her. Healers, those with the gift, are born with it. They just have to learn to identify it, strengthen it. So, first, I will take the shield from you, and I wish you to do just that. Find that tie, and wait a moment. 
I will touch your mind with mine and show you the strength of the earth about you and how to pull that strength into yourself. Keisha was too excited now to be apprehensive. She had always enjoyed learning, and now she was about to be given the keys to mysteries that had frustrated her for years. She closed her eyes and sought that still, deep place within herself where her tree dreams came from. It was easy enough to touch, but a moment after she did so, something strange happened. There was something, someone, there as well. Something that wasn't her. Good, she heard, startled inside her head. So you have exactly the sense of self that you need already. And you are hearing me in words? Cautiously, she tried to form her reply in the same way she heard it. Yes, what is this? This is mind speech. So besides being a healer, you are also a mind speaker. That is not always, or even often, the case. It will make things easier for both of us. Now, let me come closer and touch me so that you can see through my eyes. Keisha forced herself to relax as the alien presence somehow moved closer to her and then... Oh, my! she exclaimed involuntarily. Her eyes flew open, and she felt disoriented, seeing things in the strangest kind of double vision, herself looking at Nightwind, looking at herself. She didn't have to be told to close her eyes again. She squeezed them shut as her stomach churned. Nightwind also closed her eyes, making things easier. Nightwind waited patiently until her insides settled, then opened her own eyes. Now, see what I am seeing? This is just the surface of the world. This is how a healer sees it, with the oversight. The world was suddenly alive with light, all colors of light. To Nightwind's eyes, Keisha had a halo of emerald green. The seedlings growing on the window ledge had a similar halo of light, though weaker. Keisha had a sudden flash of memory. She had seen the world like this before, but she had rejected it as a hallucination. Let me try by myself, she demanded, and Nightwind pulled away. She opened her eyes, and with a mental twist, brought this new kind of vision into focus. It worked. With a gasp, she saw the world about her as a web of light and energy. She got up and went to the window that overlooked her garden. It was unbelievable, and not only could she see the light, but... I can tell which plants aren't doing well, she exclaimed. And if I were ill... You would see that, Nightwind agreed. Now, I want you to touch the place where the light is strongest. No, with your mind, not your hand. Touch it and bring it into yourself. Here, watch me. Obediently, Keisha used this new sight to watch her teacher. It took some time before she caught the trick of what Nightwind was doing, but when she tried it tentatively, she had yet another surprise. Not suddenly, but slowly, gently, a warmth and well-being began to fill her in a way that defied description. The closest was to sitting by a warm fire on a cold night, or in the sunshine on a spring day after a long, hard winter. It was not a rush of feeling. This was more like the easy misting of a good, soaking rain, permeating the thirsting earth. It filled places she hadn't known were empty until now. Night wind said nothing, waiting as Keisha sat with closed eyes, very nearly in a trance. Finally, it was Keisha herself, feeling that she had been filled to capacity, who opened her eyes and spoke. What did I just do? What every healer does. You replenished yourself from the earth, Night wind told her. Now, the next thing you need to know, and urgently, is how to shield. This will put a barrier between you and other people. 
If you are going to stay sane, you will have to make this as much a part of you as breathing, and only let it down when you want and need to, in order to sense what is wrong with a patient. Now, here I put an artificial edge around you. See it? It was a thickening of the glow around her, as thin as a piece of paper. Keisha nodded. Now take your own energy and put it there. Make it into armor. Make it tough, flexible, and strong. Concentrate. Make it tough enough to keep me out of you. I will begin pushing on it, and you must keep me out. Impossible to describe in words, except the ones that Nightwind had just used, but very real and very palpable. Keisha felt the barrier she was creating. As she made it stronger, she felt something outside of it, pushing on it. In response, she poured more of her energy into it. She sensed it trying to tear a hole in the barrier. She responded by doing something she couldn't even have described, making the outside slippery, too slippery to catch hold of. The presence outside changed tactics, hammering blows on barrier. Rather than hardening it, she responded by making it elastic, giving under the blows and absorbing the force. Nightwind laughed, and the force vanished. Keisha waited. That was very good for a beginner, Nightwind said, tossing her hair over her shoulder. In fact, I suspect that you have been doing something all along, learning how to partially shield just under the pressure of the people around you. That would also be typical for a partly trained healer. Leave the barrier in place, Keisha. You need it. Keisha had been about to try to make the barrier go away and obediently left it alone. Now... Drop your oversight. Just look at the world again. Keisha had to close her eyes to do that, but after a moment of effort, when she opened them again, the world went back to looking normal. Nightwind smiled cheerfully. This will be much easier than either of us thought, she assured Keisha. So, pack up enough for a trip of a few days. You will be coming back to Kevaldemar Vale with us. She actually grinned as Keisha's mouth dropped. Oh, you are about to receive some very intense training. And do not worry about your village. We will make certain that if you are needed, we will have you here in time to help. And this is a better compromise, I think, than sending you far away to the great collegium. Yes? Keisha could only nod dumbly. After all, hadn't this been what she wanted? Now she would actually get the training she needed without having to leave the area. But going to live with Hawk Brothers, she could hardly imagine it. And what would the villagers say? Mum is going to have a litter of kittens. I am going to rejoin the rest of our group, Nightwind told her. I will inform your mayor and so forth that you will be coming with us when we leave. Well, at least I won't have to. I will tell him that this is also at the orders of Healer Gill and Lord Brion, Nightwind added, and her eyes twinkled with suppressed laughter. I suspect that will put an end to any objections before they start. Pack carefully. Take only what you think you most will need and will not find in our veil. We will take care of most everything, even clothing, if you like. I will come get you when we are ready to leave. With that, Nightwind rose and left, leaving Keisha feeling as if a real wind had blown in, turned everything upside down, and left again. But, oh... It felt so good.